Good evening. Welcome to the Cabarrus County Board of Education April 8, 2004 work session and public hearing for the 24-25 budget. I'd like to go to 1.01 where I'll call this meeting to order. We'll move board members to 2.01 if you'll stand as we say the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you. We'll move to 3.01, where I will need a motion to adopt the agenda as presented. So moved. Second. I have a motion by Ms. Lindsay, a second by Mr. Floyd. Is there any discussion, board members? Hearing none, all those in favor of adopting the agenda as presented say aye. Aye. Opposed? The agenda is adopted as presented. We will move to 4.01, our speakers address the board regarding the Cabarrus County Schools budget of physical year 2024-25. Speakers will be called by the board chair to approach the podium to address the board regarding the budget for physical year 24-25 and the order in which they signed up to speak. Individuals will speak for three minutes, and a person speaking on behalf of a group may speak for five minutes. Groups must select one speaker to represent them. Speakers may address the board only one time and in one capacity. So I'm going to um, call the first speaker up is Amber Pope. Is Ms. Pope present? Not hearing her respond, we're going to go to our second speaker is Keisha Gardibo, Gardido. Is she here? Okay, I do not see any one of the speakers. Those are the only two speakers on the list. So board members, we will go to 5.01, board chair comments. I'd just like to remind everyone and um, our schools that our Board of Education intern application process is live now and there will those will be out there for our students to apply for the deadline for that is April the 22nd so please if you're interested in being a Board of Education intern please fill that application out we'll move to 5.02 with superintendent comments with Dr. John Kapicki. Thank you, Mrs. Adcock. Good evening. First, I would like to let the public be aware that our parent engagement survey will begin tomorrow. This is our 2024 parent engagement survey. And it will go live on our engagement website, www.engagewithccs.com. Survey instructions will be shared via Parent Square on Tuesday evening, and your feedback is, a, is one way for us to engage in an ongoing two-way dialogue, which is a critical step to our district providing the best educational experience for all students. This anonymous survey will take approximately 10 to 15 minutes to complete, and we thank you in advance for your participation. Again, that survey will go out tomorrow. Tomorrow evening at 6 p.m., Cabarrus County Schools will host its annual Hispanic Family Resource Night. This event will be held at Winkler Middle School. We ask you to join us and learn about our organizations serving Cabarrus County, such as Cabarrus Health Alliance, Charlotte Center for Legal Advocacy, El Puente Hispano, and more. Activities for children will be available and food will be served. Our Youth Art Month celebration at the Gibson Mill will be held this Friday night at 5 p.m. at the Gibson Mill Market for our Cabarrus County Schools Youth Art Mo Month Festival. Our fine art students and teachers across the district are looking forward to displaying the incredible work going on inside their buildings. And I'd like to congratulate and thank all of our students and staff across the district on your outstanding work throughout the year. And we look forward to sharing that talent with the community on Friday night. And to Mr. Bart Tolbert for all the work that he has done in advertising and promoting this work and our principals and our teachers, I thank you very much. Uh, much of that student work hung here in the Edge Center for the last couple of weeks and it's always refreshing and amazing to see the talent that we have and 
and to see the, the fruition of the work that our students participate in on a daily basis. So it's really neat to see that work. So we look forward to Friday night's event as well. Graduation. Hard to believe but we are less than six weeks away from the start of our graduating class of 2024. Early college graduations will be held on Saturday, May 18th at West Cabarrus High School. And our traditional high school graduations will be held May 22nd, 23rd, and 24th at the Cabarrus Arena and Event Center. For more information, please visit our district graduation website at the Cabarrus County website. Congratulations to Fenidra Bulusu, an eighth grade student at Harris Road Middle School and the winner of the CCS District Spelling Bee. She finished as a runner up at the Carolina Panthers and Scripps Regional Spelling Bee on March 17th at the Bank of America Stadium. This qualifies Fenidra to participate in the Scripps National Spelling Bee in Maryland on May 26th through June 1st. This is an awesome honor and an accomplishment for Fenidra, and we wish him the best of luck as he participates in the National Bee. Reminder to everyone, our kindergarten registration is gearing up in our elementary schools for the class of 2037's arrival in August, and kindergarten registration is underway. Our elementary schools will hold both day and night in-person events for registration. For a schedule of these events again, or to enroll your future kindergarten, please visit our district website and look for the kindergarten link. Our spring community engagement series will continue this Thursday at Hickory Ridge High School at 6 p.m. in the Media Center. I want to thank all of our community members who have attended the meeting thus far. Parents, staff, and community members are encouraged to attend these meetings where your feeder high school corresponds. And for a complete schedule, again, it's on our website at the Cabarrus County site. And then lastly, we have the New to School Nights. Schools across the district will hold new to school events this spring to allow an opportunity for new students and families to visit the school, meet staff, and become acquainted to the new school prior to the start of the new school year in August. These events are for all families new to school, including anyone affected by realignment, rising sixth grade families in the middle schools, rising ninth grade families in the high schools. New to school event schedules may be accessed again on our district website under families. And if you look at the families tab, you click on that and look at realignment resources. And for more information on these events, please contact your 2024, 2025 assigned schools main office. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vicki. We will move to 5.03, our board attorney comments. Mr. Eisenhower, do you have anything to share with the board at this time? No, I don't. Thank you. We will move to our report section and 6.01 with our program choice hub stops with Dr. Jonathan Bowers and Heather Stowe. Welcome. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the board, Dr. Kapicki, hope that each of you are doing well tonight. Uh, certainly here with me tonight is Ms. Amber Stowe, and what we want to do is bring before the board tonight just an update on where we stand with our hub stops for next year as it pertains to program choice. Um, this is an annual review that usually takes place. We want to make sure that certainly when we're looking at providing transportation to students to access some of our curricular offerings and some of our programs, we're doing the best we can to make sure that not only are we doing so in a very efficient manner, but also that we're making sure that we have appropriate transportation placed in areas where we can serve the greatest number of students. So tonight, this is really specific just to the hub stops themselves. Um, doesn't really pertain to program placement or uh, the program itself. Uh, I believe back in uh, October, if I'm not mistaken, the board heard from our academics team uh, sort of program choice placements and program pathways and what that would look like for the 24-25 school year. Uh, tonight's just to give you an idea of some of the services we're able to offer and where students might actually be able to identify and locate hub stops for a particular program to which they may be interested. <clears throat> so really what you have here is a list of current schools that are served by hub stops. I wanted to make sure that you understood where these schools were located throughout the district. And in the 23-24 school year, you can see here we have eight different schools with eight different specific programmings that are served across the county. These we refer to as magnet options. And the reason we refer to it as magnet is because these particular programs are open to students from outside the boundary uh, of that particular school. 
Uh, so there's a process to which I'm sure Ms. Stowe is well versed in to which individuals would apply for, uh, and then certainly there would then be a lottery, and then there's a period to which they would accept seats to these programs. Once that process plays out, what we would then do is come back from a transportation standpoint and say, how can we best provide some sort of transportation, not in all cases, but in the cases where we can actually serve the greatest number of students possible and still maintain our core service of transportation for the 35,000 students across Cabarrus County Schools. This is really the policy, and the reason I introduced that is we always want to start with making sure that we have the interest of the policy in mind and we're operating within the spirit of what the policy allows. So when the policy speaks about program choice, it talks about elements such as diversity, balance, geography, and really serving the greatest number of students possible. So in an effort when we look at this through the lens of how can we equip ourselves and provide a service, we want to make sure that those are at the forefront of what we do. Uh, and again, that becomes the driving factor and the impetus behind any decisions that we would make. So again, these became the key criteria for determination of home stops. Uh, and that's, again, you can see diversity across the board. We want to make sure that we have a uh, socioeconomic balance, but also a geographic balance. That we're not overly represented in some area while not giving attention to others, because we know that that can sometimes then not create an opportunity for students from a different area or geographic region to attend a particular program. So what we did is we put together a steering committee, and the steering committee is really a bit of a, just a, a working group. That's all it became. And we wanted to make sure that as we looked at this, is that this was not a singular decision. This was not any one to person or any one department that is trying to see it through their lens, because we always know that when we bring in different perspectives, we can sometimes see, see, three, see things through different eyes, and it gives us a chance to, to sometimes enhance what we're able to do and what we're able to offer. And so this working team or this working group was comprised of members from our transportation department, our curriculum instruction team, uh, program choice, and they also relied on our student planning team, our GIS specialists and demographics to be able to say, okay, where are students located? Where are students residing? And making sure that we have a placement of, pro of stops in areas of demand. And that would certainly be a driving factor there. You can see there's a sequence of events. So really just reviewed on a timeline of some key events that took place as it pertained to program choice because we couldn't really make hub stop determinations until we knew which students had accepted seats into programs and which students had expressed an interest in transportation for the 24-25 school year. And so this is currently what's in place now. You can get a sense of what we're offering, where we're offering stops, and the number of students that are served. Again, these numbers at the start of the year remain stronger, and then they dwindle and decline as the year goes on. It's just natural attrition to be expected. It's the same thing we see in our traditional ridership as well, and in our core service model as well. So with that, I'm going to pause. I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Stowe to talk about some, what our direction might be for next year and some of the hub stop placements and some of the rationale that went behind that. Good evening. Uh, these are the maps that were drawn through GIS to kind of show for each of our, uh, our sections of where our hub stops will be located for the 24-25 school year. This is our elementary schools, which comprise of our STEM and our arts programs. You can kind of see with our arts, that is a full magnet or partial magnet where they have people from all over the county attending as well as half neighborhood. And as you can see from this map, we have um, hub stops that are all across Cabarrus County so that that way parents will have access to transportation. As far as our STEM for elementary school, those will be for our Brown and Coltrane web. And as you can see um, through those areas where we are providing hub stops, one at Rocky River, one at uh, R. Brown, and then we also have um, some hub stops in our Northwest area uh, with Cox Mill Elementary School and um, Odell as well. As far as our middle school programs, the things that we have are for um, our IB and our STEM program, as well as our um, six through eight for Royal Oaks as well. And these are where our hub stops will be as well as our DLI and language. Um, we have uh, quite a number of buses coming from um, the Hickory Ridge area, I'm sorry, the Harris Road area, as well as uh, Roberta Road and um, the Cox Mill area as well. 
for our middle school, I'm, I'm sorry, for our high school programs, we do not do anything for any of our academies. We have nine academies, so we focus on our STEM and IB, um, which are located at Central Cabarrus High School, Concord High School, and Northwest Cabarrus High School. And here you can see our hub stops that are located at, uh, right now, it's Hickory Ridge, but uh, Cox Mill High School, J.M. Robinson High School, and Concord High School as well. This is a list of our hub stops for the 2024-2025 school year. Um, the colors denote stops that we are going to eliminate, consolidate, and propose new stops. Uh, the reason for the elimination of the stop at Hickory Ridge is we only had three students riding that bus, and so it's just not economically feasible to have a bus for three students, so we are wanting to eliminate that stop. Um, we've added some additional stops. We added a stop for uh, Cox Mill uh, for Winkler specifically in the Cox Mill area that had to do with realignment and there were a lot of students who were going back to Harris Road and we wanted to give them the option to stay at Winkler and so providing a hub stop in that area will provide transportation for those families. We also wanted to offer uh, more ridership for students who, are, who attend Roberta Road in the DLI program. Uh, Harrisburg Elementary School obviously has a Mandarin program and we wanted to be able to allow for our families to be able to attend Roberta Road there. So we added a st uh, stop there as well as a stop at Winkler, which is kind of centrally located for parents to get to Roberta Road. Um, for STEM, uh, for J.M. Freeze, we offered a new stop at uh, R. Brown McAllister. This will help with just the area within the Beverly Hills area to allow for uh, parents to uh, to offer a central location there, as well as we are consolidating stops that were um, within a ridership that will now be at uh, Urban Elementary School that will also get to, go to J.M. Freeze. Uh, with A.T. Allen, uh, with the redistricting of A.T. Allen students, they were previously Patriot students. We wanted to offer a hub stop to allow for those students who were now zoned for our Brown McAllister. Um, so we have a stop at Rocky River Elementary School to allow for those students to be able to attend. This is just a recap of our hub stop changes. Again, we have a consolidation of the door-to-door -door service for our JM Free students. The reason for this is um, the current door-to-door -door service just does not provide a geographic balance. It's just focusing on one particular area. We removed the hub stop for Hickory Ridge High School um, that was at Central Cabarrus. And again, that was basically because of the low ridership. We added five additional stops. The additional stop for students for R. Brown McAllister to continue with that STEM pipeline to JM Freeze. We added the additional hub stop for centralized location for our DLI pipeline for Roberta Road and our Spanish program at Winkler. We added a hub stop for our Harrisburg students to be able to continue with the DLI pipeline for Mandarin. And we also added a hub stop for the newly zoned Winkler students to continue the IB pathway uh, through uh, Harris Road location, as well as added an additional stop for Rocky River newly um, zoned AT Allen students to go to our Brown McAllister. So as we look ahead, obviously, this is an annual review. It always takes place. We want to make sure, again, we're doing the best we can with the resources we have and serving the greatest number of students. And we're also intentional about where hub stop locations may be placed. Um, things evolve from year to year, and we know that. Uh, and children progress through programs, and um, there may be a pipeline coming behind them we want to continue to serve, or in many cases, there may not be that same demand. And we will make sure that we can shift resources accordingly. So as we look ahead to future years in planning, one element that uh, we do have to certainly encounter or face is that uh, hubstop transportation is a locally absorbed expense. That's something that we have to pay for uh, through local dollars. Uh, the reason being is that when students are transported outside their home attendance boundary, there's a cost that's incurred for that, and that's not always reimbursable by the state. So when we look at this and we say, okay, what has been budgeted over the course of the year, we see that there would be not something that needs to be taken into consideration for future budget considerations to continue on this magnitude and for any possible expansion. So that's something we'll always keep our eyes on. We want to try to find ways to continue to expand to more programs. One of the benefits of this year's hub stop placements is that we're able to add five additional stops that were not there previously. And so that's expansion of a service. That's giving students a chance to continue these 
pathways in a locale to which they've applied to um, and certainly hope they will see that through and matriculate through other programs that would be available. Uh, we'd like to take that to scale with our DLI programming one day within means and so we'll continue to monitor that. We'd love to see opportunities to expand our ID programming opportunities for transportation. That's another one because again we know the, uh, the benefits of, of what the program can offer especially for those students who are going to stay with the rigors of that particular programming pathway over their four years. And then ultimately we want to make sure that we're doing the best we can with the resources we have and with what the being good stewards of the taxpayers dollar. That's essentially what it boils down to. And so try to be ways to be innovative and creative such that ideally in a for utopian society we'd love to be able to provide every student uh, with uh, access uh, to transportation to a program. But we understand the realities of finite resources as well and we certainly have to balance those out. So I will pause there and uh, certainly for any questions that you may have. Board members, do you have any questions? Mr. Floyd? Uh, on slide eight, middle school uh, map here, so to make sure I understand that right, <clears throat> looking at um, a couple of those have AM and PM stops. Yes, sir. For different schools. Can you, can you talk about that a little bit more? I think we glossed over that and I want to make sure I understand. No, that great right. question thank and, and thank you for pointing that out. Um, so in working with our transportation team, what we find sometimes is that our pickup and drop off times may conflict with a school's arrival and or departure time. And so when we see heavy flows of traffic or we see some choke points or congestion around a particular school, what we find is that it may be better to pivot to another location that is regionally in, in close proximity to that site while still allowing the service. So what you'll see there when it says AM for Cox Mill High School, for example, um, we have a route that's going to be an AM drop off at our pickup, excuse me, at Cox Mill High School to service Winkler Middle School for ID programming. But then we would flip that then for a return route in the afternoon to be able to drop off with Harris Road. Uh, does that make sense? It does. The one that kind of caught my eye is AM leaving from R. Brown, PM at Concord. I mean, that's just a big, not a big gap, but it's a it's a distance. Yes, sir. No, uh, understandably so. And thank you again. Uh, another challenge, too, with middle school dismissal times being what they are, uh, we want to be mindful that we're not dropping kids off on a campus without supervision in place long after a school might have dismissed. So that's that's another element as well. So it, again, it's um, uh, it, it, not the best of what we would want, but we want to make sure we're taking care of students and putting them in a safe environment as well. No problem. So make sure everybody kind of understands thank why and, and how we're doing that. Ms. Sandage. Thanks for the presentation. I truly appreciate the work on this. Um, can I ask if we are allowed to have parents on the steering committee or has that ever been discussed? It has not because a lot of times what we do is we base this off of what would be the demand for transportation that originates from the families themselves. So a lot of that's a driving factor is self-interest and that's part of the application process itself is that families will denote, hey, I'm interested in transportation. So much like we use information for our normal transportation routing practices with feedback we get from families to determine what would be appropriate bus stops, this more or less replicates that process. Uh, it's not to say that we can, it's just, again, deviating from where the demand is and from where people are generating the interest, we use that to drive the hub stop placement. Understood. Can you uh, clarify for us how someone identifies that they need transportation? Like, how do they qualify for transportation for hub stops? There are two ways that they can do that. On the Scribbles application, there is a checkbox to denote that you would need uh, program choice transportation. They do that there as well as whenever they register for their bus, which they're doing actually right now. Um, there is a flag on the program. Once they have been accepted, they get a ridership form to state whether they need transportation or not. How is one accepted? Like what's that process? There's there's no criteria to say like someone can't get it. If they okay. say that they need the transportation and it is a part of the hub stop process, they are able to ride that bus. Okay. On this slide that we're looking at now, um, it looks like a lot of our rural area is not utilizing the hub stops. Do we know why that's the case? Great, great question. Yes, ma'am. So one of the things we did this year, and I think for the first time we've done since this um, exercise has been in place, um, is was to geocode students. I actually physically placed them on a map with their residents, with those who had expressed interest in transportation and had been accepted into a program. What we found is those areas to which you see sort of these voids, there had not been interest. Uh, mm -hmm. Typically what we find is low, low. I shouldn't say low interest, um, there aren't many applicants that hail from those areas for a lot of our program choice pathways. 
got it. And those three students that will not have a hub stop, what happens to them? We will be contacting the three students that, well, right now, I don't even think anyone's riding the bus. There were three who had initially signed up and now there is no one, although we still do provide the stop just in case they say one day that they do want to get on the bus till the end of the school year. But we plan on contacting those parents to let them know through the schools that we will not be offering a hub stop in that area. Okay, follow up question to that. When we identify that there's three students that are on a bus and it's just not financially um, responsible, in my opinion, for us, could we offer like a van as opposed to sending a bus there? I'm like, what is the planning around that? Could we? The answer is yes. Is it more cost efficient? The answer is no, because uh, okay. there still would be an incurred cost, and now we would pay him what the transportation mileage would be for the van itself to be able to transport students for that same distance. So to put that into perspective, is there literally three kids on a bus? Do I understand that correctly? Well, it and again. It started off with a greater number. So at the beginning of the year, what we found is that there were greater than 10. 10 usually becomes that threshold number to which now all of a sudden there's enough demand that would interest in placing a stop for consideration. With the three students, that number was greater than 10 to start the school year. It had dwindled to three at one point, and then it had just waned off after that. So again, based off the data, based off contacting the families, the no longer need to ride, there was no interest in ride stop. And typically what the bus garage does is they will pick those students up and then as they enter into their geo zone, they pick up students and add them to the route. So it's not that there's just three students on the bus from right. one school to the next. Once okay. they get to the That's area, helpful. they add the stops yeah. that are in their route. That's helpful. And then on the steering committee, um, can you tell me if there is anyone from like, I can't remember, GIS, Francis, is there some? Okay. Yes, ma'am. Okay, was good. That, team, the, the, and I probably should use work group better <laughs> instead of steering committee with okay. a more appropriate name. And then how many students are there total in program choice that do not use the transportation? Well, right now we have approximately 4,000 students who are in program choice. Again, some of those are students within their same attendance zone that are within a program, so they would get their neighborhood bus. Um, and we have about 549 that utilizes our bus. Thank you. So for next year, and I can give you those numbers too, Ms. Sandage, we have right now uh, roughly 2,700 students from outside boundary areas who have expressed interest and accepted seats to attend programs within areas other than their zoned area. And of those, we have about 600 students who have expressed interest in transportation. I'm sorry, I do have one more question. Sure. Can you go back to the, the policy, the slide after policy? I can't remember the number. Uh, yeah, yes. that one. Yes, How do we determine if we are meeting these objectives? Once again, that would be the ridership information that we're able to obtain. That would be the areas in which the hub stops themselves are placed and then the geographic area to which they're served. Okay, so we do validate this every yes. every year. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Ms. Escobar. Thank you uh, for all this work and for trying to um, expand the hub stops. Uh, I think that's really important. Uh, Hick Harrisburg Elementary, can you clarify that? So Harrisburg Elementary, DLI, they're going to now be able to go to Roberta Road, those rising um, sixth graders. Are they going to Hickory Ridge Middle School or is the stop at Harrisburg Elementary? I, the, just, I was just trying to clarify this. The other slide, I think, said Harrisburg Middle School, and I didn't think that that existed. Originally, we were going to have it at Harrisburg Elementary, but in talking with our endorsed from transportation, we have moved that to Hickory Ridge. Okay. So we'll update that slide. And then, um, I, I, I'm to be clear, my daughter is on uh, the currently she's in the Roberta Road uh, Mandarin program, and so she currently is at the Harris Road, and that is one of the stops that's changing. Um, and I do think that that makes a lot of sense just as a parent um, traffic wise. Um, over there, Harrisburg, or excuse me, Harris Road Middle School and then Odell Elementary. Is that primary elementary? It's the primary, primary. primary, okay. It's really, really busy um, in the morning over there. And that's the, Odell does not have really a good queuing system. And so I guess my question is, is was there, as part of this group, mm -hmm. did you talk to principals? Um, because uh, what is the possibility for those culture and web kids 
to, um, instead of going to that Odell, switching to the other Odell. And the reason why is just the timing. From what I understand, and I apologize, I'm getting the Odells mixed up, but one of them starts at seven something in the morning and the other one starts at eight in the morning. And so just sitting in that traffic and, and for the SROs and everybody, I, I, don't, I just, two buses of kids, I think it would maybe be better to stick them in the bigger parking lot versus in the smaller parking lot. No, and, and I appreciate you mentioning that. That was one of the things that the, uh, the, the group work group considered. Now, again, as we expand, obviously we're looking for ways to be more creative and innovative with this. Um, the challenge there, uh, the Odell primary starts at 7.30. What that allows for there to be is supervision on site when children arrive for there to be pickups in the morning because the students that traverse from Odell primary, they're taking our longest, quite honestly, bus route for a STEM program. Um, they're coming from that area into Coltrane Webb. So that's one of the longest traversed areas that we do have. So moving it to another one, we would run the risk of having, and again, we looked at it, of pick up on site without supervision at the school for bus times that would be leaving well in advance of seven o'clock. Okay, so I'm just looking at the map. This, mm -hmm. the, we have the elementary one up. Um, so right now you're saying that the bus is at the primary, that's, that's next to Harris Road or no? Yes, ma'am, that's okay. correct, yes. Okay, I thought they started at eight. And then I thought the elementary starts at seven. Is that right? I think it's a thirty-minute time difference. It's thirty-minute time, or seven thirty, or whatever it okay. is. Okay. Um, so anyway, I, I'm just asking, could you yeah. look into that and talk to the principals and see? But I just think that the this, that parking lot's really small, and two buses right. with parents adding another. Because what happens is, and is just parents give up on the hub stop if the bus isn't showing up on time or whatever so then they start driving their kids to school and you just put more cars in a place that can't handle the cars I will tell you that when we created our hub stops we did send all of the principals that are going to be housing hub stops and said that we will be working with the planners to see exactly what location on your campus would be best suited to have parents there as for drop off and pick up we know that was also a concern for Mr. Bocart at Harris Road yeah. as well in the afternoon. So we are going to be working with them individually over the summer to see where is the best location that we can have those specific stops. And that was part of the logic in pulling that one stop that would be serving Winkler Middle School right. off of Harris Road to place it at Cox Mills. So that's, again, was at the heart of it, but we'll continue to look for ways we can lessen some of the density and some of the traffic. There. Right, because it's just those middle schools, because those hub stops start so early, sure. they're they're running into the elementary school um, time. Yeah. So it's just, it's a lot of cars, it's a lot of parents, and if there's any way to sort of break up the demand at, at that intersection, that would be great. But I, I really appreciate the effort, and I really, uh, I just think that there was a lot of thought put into it. And I, I thank Ms. Sandage for asking about the Hickory Ridge, just making sure that um, that's communicated and, and there's um, no one's surprised that, hey, I signed up for this seat and then I can't get my kid there. So thank you so much. Just for just to clarify, clarify Odell Elementary starts at 7.30 to 2.15 and Odell Primary is 8.15 to 3 p.m. Right, so my suggestion would be to mm. move the hub stop to the earlier start time school yeah. so then that way that those parents aren't running into the parents. I mean, cause it's a lot, I mean, I forget the number on the other slide, but it's it was a lot of kids, right? In Coltrane will be our early start school this year, and so no, they're. No, they're they're an 815. I'm sorry. Coltrane's 815. Yeah, they're fine. Thank you. Okay. All right. Sorry. So Thanks. the Col the Coltrane Webb School that Miss Stowe is referring to, um, that would be Coltrane Webb Elementary School and R. Brown McAllister. Um, not to get ahead of ourselves, but we are looking at starting Coltrane Webb at 8.15 and R. Brown McAllister at 7.30. And if you just think about the logistics of how those schools sit front and back, how right. we're looking at that. Okay. We'll update the board probably in about two weeks because we want to get through our budget process and we have a county budget meeting tomorrow. Obviously, there's a capital plan that's on our, on our, on our agenda tonight to go through. So there's some things we want to take care of first before we make that official, but that's what we're taking a look at right now. Thank you. Any other questions, board members? Okay, thank you. All right, thank you. So we will move to 6.02 with our 2024
2025 bu uh, budget recommendations with Mr. Phil Penn. Welcome. Good evening, everyone. Actually, can we go to the uh, PowerPoint instead, please? Thank you. So, board members, I know we went through this in some detail uh, a couple of weeks ago. My intent tonight was to take you through sort of what's changed over that time frame. Um, what you'll wind up seeing is a simplification of some of the numbers, the way we were presenting them, based on feedback we got from the, uh, the county. Uh, some moves also based on feedback that we retained from them and frankly uh, at least two mistakes that we fixed along the way and we'll go through all that. So I, I'm not going to go over slides you've already seen that didn't change. Uh, I did put in the people that are reviewing this at home and had an opportunity to see it on the website calling this a digital post-it note uh, that you'll see throughout. Uh, we were sort of tagged what's changed on the slide. So on slide seven, the first thing that we changed is you'll see that we've simplified this exhibit quite a bit, removing all the non-CCS items from it. Uh, what I've learned in conversations with the county is they have to appropriate the schools based on the exact amount per pupil expenditure wise. So they kind of use us as the lead. Uh, whatever comes to us will be what goes out to KCS and others as well. Uh, at their recommendation, we have also moved the proposed six new staff members that were classified staff to the expansion part of the budget. Uh, that is consistent with the way that they approach expansion as well. Uh, we've moved device refresh to capital. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about when we get there, why that was done. Uh, but the simple answer is we think that's going to be a, a, a cost for the foreseeable future. And yeah, admitting to the mistake that was there, we corrected some of the facilities total. I found something that was double counted, and we also found a project that was in two different places. We only needed it in one place. So what you'll see here is you kind of walk down the slide, uh, the instructional services piece, the facilities piece, the technology piece gets you to do 92.8 million. We then take out uh, what we expect to receive for fines and forfeitures from the county, uh, interest that we make on our cash investments, and our special revenue fund will take us down to a net continuation request of $85.8 million that you see at the bottom. I would call that a $2.5 million increase year over year, or about 3%. The county views it as a $4.1 million increase. The difference in the two methodologies is the $1.6 million in 2324 for fines and forfeitures and interest on investments. They said that's variable data, that's variable income, so they don't count it the same way I would look at it. Neither, neither methodology is more wrong, correct or more wrong than the other one. It's just if you hear 4.1, that's how they look at it. I personally would look at it as 2.5, and that's what I've reflected here on the slide. So I put down now at the bottom, just for informational purposes, what charter school funding looks like going forward. Our estimate right now continues to be just under that $7 million. Uh, that's been cleaned up a little bit for uh, what we now expect to be uh, the number based on our PP per, uh, per pupil expenditures if this budget was to pass as presented. No change on the continuation budget will reflect the certified staffing. On slide nine, we did move the six people that were presented here in the last time to what is now in the expansion request, and we'll see that as we go forward. All right, this one takes a little bit of an explanation because I realized something that if you look at the first column at the top of the title, it says 2324 estimate. When I realized I had on there was actually the budget, and that's not the actual number that I wanted to show here. What we're trying to convey is the impact of the contracted services, the impact of a few other things that we'll see going forward. Our best view of contracted services this year is that $5.3 million figure, which is above what the budget was. And our projection for next year is even higher at $5.7 million. So I want to make sure I explain that correctly, right? We're, we're looking at, the, at what we think we're going to spend in 23-24 in that first column and what we think we're going to spend for 24-25 in the, in the last column. Same thing with the transportation uh, estimate here. You remember that I had a conversation around what that $500,000 reflected for 24-25. It's the cost associated with running program choice that's not reimbursed by the state. But in the left column, I showed a zero, and that's not accurate. We know that we're spending $500,000 this year as well. Again, just truing up the methodology to say, okay, 23-24, the estimate is $500,000, but we need to make sure that that's actually part of the budget ask for 24-25. Same methodology here. 
uh, correcting the fire alarm systems and the general repair estimates for what we feel the numbers are going to be for 23-24, what the resulting ask is for 24-25. Slide 13, same methodology, what do we anticipate spending on HVAC this year versus what do we expect to spend in 24-25, okay? So that, that doesn't change the overall ask, it just trues up 23-24's column to reflect where we think we're going to land. So here you see a major change from what was last time. We've removed $5 million off this slide under the annual computer leases. We've moved that over to capital. And when we talk about the capital, I'll sort of explain the methodology and the recommendation as to why we're doing that. Uh, that takes the overall capital, uh, excuse me, overall technology request down to $3.1 million from three point nine, and the, the entire difference is in that annual computer lease line as the leases are expected to roll off with one last year to go. Expansion requests, uh, what's changed here? Well, you'll see uh, the two additional IT field technicians and the two behavior techs, one data accountability specialist, one professional development person. Those are the six classified personnel that moved over from the continuation request. Again, at the county's recommendation, because the way that they treat any new personnel, it's part of the expansion request, not part of the continuation request. What we've also added here is an effort by the cabinet to prioritize what our top five requests would be out of the expansion space. Uh, there's been a lot of conversation around the classified salary study. Uh, Dr. Williams and I talked about that at a couple of board meetings ago, that we need the county's funding to move forward with implementing all the recommendations out of that. We picked that as number one. Number two and number three, and I'll hop back to the previous slide, are the two items related to student, student safety. You know, I think any time you go through an expansion request, it's got to be sort of near the top. We also argue that in the same light as wanting to make sure that we have our classified staff paid appropriately, we want to make sure we're retaining or remaining competitive with respect to our certified staff. We made the increased certified supplement by one percentage point, our priority number four. And looking at the three software packages that are currently funded by ESSER, those are very high touch packages in terms of how widely they're used across the district. If we were not able to obtain funding, we would have to find it somewhere else. We cannot do away with those three packages as it exists right now. That's the, that's the crux of how we came up with number five for those. Okay. What's changed here? It's just the total on this page. The, now, the total expansion request now sits at $6.7 million, higher because of what we added in terms of the personnel. That's the, the, the key difference between these. So just as a reminder, we've got three different pieces to the capital. The major change on here is that we conformed it back to the million twenty that we think we expect to get. Uh, that's been consistent for four now four years now. The amount of money that would, they've given us within this project space, the two school specific items that were here before have been removed, and we basically shaved money off the remainder to get down to the million twenty. Uh, one of the things that we didn't touch, for instance, was the McKinney Vento vans. We feel that those are critical. Uh, we did not shave money off that line item. Uh, but you'll see we now conform with the, uh, the one million twenty thousand dollars that we've received for four straight years. No change on this, no change on this. However, well, uh, one of the things I wanted to point out here is the second item down on this list, that stadium restroom replacement at Concord High School for four hundred ninety eight thousand dollars. What we realized is that it was on a different list with the top ten um, other capital items, so we basically have the same project duplicated at two different price points. The $498,000 one is the correct one, so there's no change to this slide. But as you'll see in a few seconds, uh, we moved it over to, uh, we took it off uh, one of the other capital slides, and I'll explain when we get there. Before we get to that, though, I want to talk about what, why we put the capital refresh for device, uh, device refreshes into capital. The reality is you're going to need that every year going forward, right? So we talked about how it's a little bit over $20 million, 22-ish if I recall the number correctly, to replace all the devices all at once right now. So in effect, you're going to have to put $5 million up every year going forward to replace about a quarter of your devices. Some devices will have a little bit more longer shelf life than that. We recognize that. But the reality is this is part of your embedded cost now of doing business going forward. To the extent you want to continue to have one-to-one -one device technology for your kids and the fact that you want to replace the staff devices as it becomes needed, uh, this really needs to be part of the ongoing cost in the capital section. Uh, it's consistent with the way the county does their device refreshes, and so at their recommendation, we've moved this over to capital. 
Now what you'll see here is what the prior number 10 project on this was the same project that you saw that I pointed out on the other, on the other list. We realized we had it in two different places. When we had it here, it was $550,000. So it was technically at two different price points. But as I said, the one less than 500000 is the correct one. So that effectively bumped up what would have been project number 11 initially to project number 10 here. Well, going from a $550,000 project to a project of over $9 million, the total for these top 10 now has gone up appreciably to that $41.3 million, right? So again, you see in the note at the bottom, we replaced number, number 10 because it was duplicated in our top 36 list. So on the summary slide, basically everything's changed, right? Because now we conformed everything that's here for all the changes I just went over with you. You'll see the continuation request at the top. You'll see all the different expansion items now at that $6.7 million figure I mentioned earlier. Capital outlay is at a, now at a million twenty. The projects from 25 to 499 did not change. New construction did not change. Equipment went up because of the $5 million increase of the device refresh that's now in there. Maintenance projects went up to the $41.3 million because of the swap between moving from project number 11 to project number 10. Takes us to overall funding requests at 254 point, well, call it $255 million. Okay. Those are all the changes that have transpired in the presentation since you last saw it. It really doesn't change the amount that we're looking for uh, other than the fact of the capital, uh, that one item being bumped out of 11 to 10. But the overall ask between the expansion and the uh, continuation request is basically the same number in total. It's just the buckets moved. Okay. Questions? Any questions, board members? Ms. Escobar? Thank you. Uh, okay. Thank you for the explanations, too, and the prioritization that helped me. Uh, go back to this Concord High School renovation of the bathroom. Mm -hmm. um, so those were, you just had that twice in, cap, in capital. It was in two different places in capital for the same project. That's right. Okay. And by putting it on the one list and not on the other list, like, what's the logic for we, keeping we pick, it here we pick, versus we pick, there? We pick the correct price point. Well, so no, in other words, since the price points determine what list it appears on, the project's under $500,000, it has to be on the, on the list that's from $25,000 to $500,000. When, when, we, when we had it over $500,000 and $550,000, which was the wrong correct price point, it simply just comes off that list. Okay. And then we prioritized in the expansion, but we don't prioritize in, in capital? Actually, we do. So if you were to go back as a, for instance, within these, with all the different deferred maintenance projects, these become our top 10, right? The only difference is what was project top 10 dropped off, number 11 moved up to 10. When we look at the top 36 projects, they're all here prioritized by what we have. I, I guess what I'm trying to understand is for the people at Concord High School, are, what's the likelihood of that project happening now? Pretty high, because it's number two on our list. Okay, because it's, it's number two on that smaller list and Correct. then the over 500. That's right. Got it. That's okay. just off that one. But it's number two on this list. Okay. Yeah. That helps me. And then uh, the expansion, mm -hmm. thank you for explaining the new personnel thing. I, I didn't understand why previously why that was changing. Um, with our number one, that 2.6 million, right? And I remember the, the presentation. Um, do we have an explanation for the county about who who these people are and like what they do we do okay yeah. so they'll, they'll get the detail if they have yeah. questions about if they that. have questions about it we'll definitely have that and, and, and i think we we can leverage the fact that the county went through a similar exercise about two or three years ago where they did a, a salary study as well i think they were going to grasp it from that perspective as well that this is this is basically us doing the same thing and, and for people who are watching who maybe missed the, the fun meeting where we talked about it before, um, wh who, are, who are classified staff? And those are not people that are working in this building, correct? Well, sure there is, because it's like me, for okay. instance, right? My team, HR's team. It's everybody who doesn't require a teaching license to perform their job. Okay. Yeah. So there's how many people? Uh, 25, 2,600? Yeah, 
3,000 throughout the, through throughout the, the district. school district. That's okay. Right. And that can be your custodians and it could be people in HR. Correct. People in finance, there, there, there are a number of people that work in different places that don't need a, a, a teaching license for the performance of their primary job. That's right. And then you guys looked at what other school districts and maybe other um, non uh, education background people Correct, would be because, making because there, there, we know that there are spots take finance as an HR as an, as an example where that skill set transports across industries right so you can't only just look at education you got to look at where we're competing for the talent right so that would be an ongoing expense if yes. they say yes if they say yes that becomes part of our embedded cost going forward that's correct it's not a one-time okay thank you Ms. Sandage so a few questions, um, and it's in relation to uh, Ms. Escobar's questions. Is there a breakdown that we will see that helps to identify where this 2.6 million is going? Or is this just being presented to the county? Like, so does the board have that breakdown already? One of the things we're being careful about is how much information that we share at this point, because if we don't get the funding, we cannot move forward with this. I've used the, the internal, I don't mean to be flipped, but I'll use the example. I don't want to be Lucy pulling away the football, right? So in other words, if I put something out there that people anticipate getting a raise because that's what we've presented and we can't move forward with it, that's effectively what I'd be doing. And I guess my concern is we've had some issues prior to you that, you know, kind of gave some heartburn and I just don't want us to get there again, which may be where Ms. Escobar's questions is coming from. I don't know that for sure. I, I, um, I can understand that. And, and, and I did read the newspaper articles. I understand where you're coming from. I'll defer to my colleague here on how do we kind of walk that line. Awesome. So <laughs> He gave me a look over the shoulder. Um, <laughs> so um, I, we've obviously um, done quite a bit of work for quite a while now to make sure that we have um, new salary scales that have been clearly vetted. They are industry aligned. Um, we actually have a meeting coming up shortly with uh, Evergreen, the, the uh, consulting firm who did this work. Um, I would tell you that I feel very comfortable with where they've landed on where those sit. Um, the back end of that is there. We can see the research that landed in behind there. Um, we, I, the, I, I've shared that with Dr. Kapicki, so he has he has been able to go through and see the multitude of spreadsheets um, that sit with it. It's a it's a file that you have to. I literally had to carry it to him on a on a drive because it's a very large file. Um, so that's there. Um, to Dr. I mean to uh, Mr. Penn's point, we I would argue have to be very careful um, setting out the put making those salary schedules public prior to having the funding that sits there. Um, because if we were to get, for example, 50% of that funding, we will go back to that consulting firm and say, this is the amount of money that we have. Help us level this to figure out how close can we get to where market value is. Um, but that is gonna look like a football pulled out. Um, I, at Dr. Kapicki's um, discretion, again, we, we, we have information. I'm not sure where he would, would want to land with sharing that with the board. Um, but, I, but I do th I want to make sure I, d at minimum, say to you, we f I feel very comfortable. And then once it is made public, we're going to make lots of pieces of this puzzle transparent that have not been transparent before. So we will be sharing the salary schedules. We'll be sharing the ways that we make those placements moving forward uh, in a way that we have not done in the past. So I think the point we're all trying to make here is we're, we're trying to be very transparent, but making sure that we don't give you information that doesn't come to fruition yet. Right. Um, so I know Dr. Williams had talked about this a couple weeks back with the board in a presentation too. Um, and I think that was well said. We're going to ask for what we, what we know it should be. And then let's see what the county then does, but with the, the ask, and then we'll come back to the board and say, this is what we received. Hopefully we get $2.6 million and we, right size everybody in the district as to where they should be according to the industry standards and um, what our consultant has, has given us that information for. So what I, would, what I would suggest and recommend is let's get through the budget process, see where we go. 
June 17th is when the county votes on their budget. Let them vote on that budget. We'll know where we are, and I can come back to the board at that point, hopefully with great news saying $2.6 million has been allocated to our classified study, uh, to our classified employees. If not, I, I will at that point come back to the board and say here's what we received, zero or whatever, and then we can show you what we should be receiving. We can advocate from there. But what we can tell you is $2.6 million gets our classified study to where they should be across across the, uh, the industry standards appropriate to whatever jobs, job uh, tasks they're performing in the district. Yeah, so let me be clear. Some years ago, there was a blanket number, and we didn't know or understand where that went. Right. Once this is approved, I am asking, will we know where that went, yes, and how yes. will that be presented Absolutely. is what I'm asking. Yes, ma'am. Okay. okay, thank you. And, and you that, might... Oh, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. That, that's what I'm saying. Once once the county approves their budget, I will come back to the board and say, this is what you received, this is where the money went, this is what the job yeah. classifications and what their salaries are. Yeah, we will not, we're not going to sit here and, and say, hey, you got 2.6 and you're wondering where the money went. We're going to explain to exactly what every job classification, what their salary is and where the money went. I appreciate you clarifying that. It was, it was prior to that county decision on funding. I was a little bit reluctant about putting stuff out there that I didn't want to lead the employees down a path that like, we can't deliver on then. Right. Yeah, I don't believe in putting the cart before the horse, right. so I sure. definitely understand. You might want to stay up here for my okay. next I question. Mean, yeah. <laughs> so, okay, so a te the principals understand their allotment, allotments. We've talked a lot about allotments. When will the staff from those allot allotments, I'm saying this wrong, know whether or not they will have a job next year? So no one through the allotment process has been has lost their job. There are no no one's lost their job. People have been displaced, and I'll let Dr. Williams speak to that if 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 the board wishes. But no one has lost, and no one will lose a job. And I just want to be very clear on that through the allotment process, Dr. Williams. So just let me clarify sure. a little bit. So if I've got a staff that sen sends me a message that says, "Hey, I got a letter." from HR that says, um, you know, my position or my whatever is not going to be here next year. Um, I'm a little anxious about what that means for me. Why would that person not know what's happening for them next year? That's what I don't understand. That's a great question. And okay. there's one group of employees that would have received those letters. Those are employees who were hired on temporary contracts that means the, a couple of different things. That means that they were hired after the first teacher workday. They would automatically go to a temporary contract. Um, they haven't, for a teacher, for example, they have not completed all of their licensure requirements. So they are in that process of getting a license, but it has not cleared yet, meaning that they haven't finished all their testing or they haven't finished all their coursework. Those are the folks that would have received a temporary letter. Those go out every single year um, because they are temporary contracts and we have to notify them by a certain point of the year that their contract that they signed is up at the end of the school year. Generally, those folks are renewed by their principals or they pick up another position in the district. Um, the word we use that, that I think kind of frames it is they become free agents at the end of the year. They can move if they want to move. Principal can choose to renew them if they want to renew them. They're free to apply for other positions. We can't guarantee them that they have a position for the next year, though, because they are on a temporary contract that expires at the end of that year. Okay, this is not a question. This is a statement. We, this is my personal opinion. We don't need to lose staff. So that if there are people in those types of positions, how do we work with them to make sure we are not losing staff? Yeah, so Mr. Reeves and I do that kind of, and with Ms. McLean, um, kind of one-on-one, -on -one, right? So we know that that list comes in. Um, what you will find is there are buildings, you know, we're in, the, we're in the middle of a student reassignment, which means that we've got some buildings that are going down about 200 kids, and we've got other buildings that are going up a couple of hundred kids. We work with those individuals to connect them with the new principals. The principals are making phone calls to them right now. We sent the list of temp contracts, goes out to the principals. They're looking for folks. Um, and so for the most part, my experience is that the, the, the teachers who are on temporary contracts who are really, really good land very quickly. 
okay? Sometimes we bump into someone on a temporary contract that is trying to figure out if this is the profession for them, and it, they may or may, they make their own decision as they get to the end of it with those temporary contracts, but for the most part, nearly all of those folks land in a new position, and we handle that with them one-on-one. -on -one. We can't guarantee it to them, but we make all of those connections, and near, annually, nearly all of those folks get picked back up in a new position. Lastly, for the person who has listened to this or the people who have listened to this and still have questions, where do they? Okay. All right. Thank That's you. Me. I handle them. Dr. I Williams handle them gesture all. to himself just in case somebody was watching this. Yeah. Okay. So I handle, I, again, Mr. Reeves and I handle those one at a time as they come in. Ms. McLean does a phenomenal job helping us with that. Um, but li when I say literally, that's all I really have done for the last week or so is one-on-one -on -one phone calls and meetings with folks. I go out, I sit down, I talk, I make connections. That's what we're doing right now. I feel so much better. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions, board members? Mr. Treadway. I just, I know we're, we're talking about budget, but I just, I, I think this is a yeasty conversation because it stresses the importance of getting teachers in place by day one. Then they're not on a temporary contract probably. Yeah. So not only does it benefit our kids, it, it benefits the school, it benefits the teacher because they know they have a contract and it's not a temporary contract. So that's why Ms. McLean is headed out recruiting right now to get folks in place by the first day of school. Mr. Floyd, do you have any questions? Okay. All right. Very good. Thank you. Okay. We'll move to 6.03 with the budget summary and board report with Mr. Penn. Hello again. <laughs> so, um, one of the things I wanted to share with the board is, uh, this is the one where I provide an outlook, kind of where are we and where do I think we're going. Um, I'm pleased to share that as we kind of completed our, our third fiscal quarter of the year, um, the outlook for the full year became a lot more uh, positive in the last 30 days. And in the memorandum, and you can see it on the screen, we identified about $800,000 of higher revenue that we now expect to hit in 23-24 compared to where we thought we were. $250,000 in additional interest income and $550,000 from additional fines and forfeiture funds from the county that they're required to remit to, uh, remit to us. Uh, that new revenue has pushed the local deficit forecast to left, less than 300000 at this point. Uh, I think there's a pretty good boss possibility, and I'll find some wood to knock on, um, that we might be tending toward a zero or a small surplus by the end of the year provided, and this is an important qualifier, there's no more adverse development through the end of this year, right? We still have 10, 11 more weeks of, this, of the fiscal year to get through. Um, but I'm proud of the work that my team did uh, in helping to resolve this in conjunction with all the rest of the management and the, and the, and the, the school leadership. Uh, we've mitigated almost $8.5 million in adverse development so far this year, right, to get us back to what I think is going to be a zero or, or something in the black instead of in the red. Um, in addition, I had talked about um, our special revenue account, Fund 8, uh, in particular some concerns that I had around Medicaid. Um, what we've been told through our public consulting group, that's the external uh, advisors that we use, is that we expect to see at least $1.1 million in Medicaid funds drop in June, uh, which would put us at somewhere between $1.4 and $1.5 million for the year versus a budget of $1.3. So now we're continuing to work pretty closely with PCG, our vendor. Uh, there's a total of $2.2 million that's owed to us right now. Uh, and I've reached out to the two primary contacts at the state that oversee this, looking for an explanation as to when we can expect to see the remainder of that money. Um, so that's what came out of that PCG meeting on April 2nd were these conversations, the right contacts at the state level to reach out to. And uh, I'll continue to update the board on this as we go forward. Uh, we want our money. That's the bottom line, right? And we'll keep pushing at the right buttons to, to make sure that we get it on time. Okay. Questions about where we are right now? Mr. Floyd? Not so much a question, but I just want to make a, a point. <clears throat> Reiterate what you said, that $8 million was 8 .5. 8.5 was mitigated here. Yeah. And that was done through very good and very hard work from your, your folks and also from everybody in the district, tightening yeah. the bootstraps and, yeah. and making do with almost nothing in some cases. And I haven't heard one complaint from any of them about it. 
Um, and they should be, I mean, they should be, but they make it work. And I just, a heartfelt thank you to everybody from the top down that's worked on this. That is a huge thing we've overcome. And that's, I say we, you all have overcome. It's very impressive. Appreciate that. Thank you. Any other comments? Okay. See you in a bit. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> we'll move to 6.04, our roofing project update. Mr. Chuck Taylor. Welcome, Mr. Taylor. Good evening, board. Dr. Kapicki. It's my pleasure to be here. Sorry, I got to put my glasses on to read this. Uh, tonight, I'd like to give you a quick briefing on all of our roofs. Everybody smile. <laughs> right? Every time we get a roof, we smile. I was looking over my notes. We don't need anything from the peanut gallery. I was looking over my notes, and it occurred to me for the first time. It should have occurred to me before now. We should all be smiling because as of this moment, and I could be off by one, but I don't think I am, we have in the last 10 years replaced 19 roofs. So that is a major accomplishment. I always tell you we need to replace three roofs every year to get on that cycle so that we don't have schools full of trash cans and buckets and everything else catching water, right? So at this time, we have five going on. They're in work and in progress. One is Concord High School, uh, Bethel Elementary, Hickory Ridge, or I'm sorry, Harris Road Middle School, W.M. Irvin Elementary, and C.C. Griffin Middle School. Those are all in progress. Uh, Harris Road is actually just waiting on a ladder and some fireproofing to be installed. W.M. Urban is in final inspections and paperwork being closed out, getting that paid out and closing that project, which is always good, especially this time of year. Uh, Bethel Elementary is in punch and we're waiting on the manufacturers to come out to approve the roof. We never pay the final pay up until the manufacturer of the material comes out and says the roofers did it correctly. Cityscape, uh, new company for us this year. They've got all the membrane down, they're working on the coping and gutters, that's all the metal around the outside and all the gutters and drainage systems. And we'll be moving to the concession stand at Concord High School next. Right after that, we'll go to the Public Safety Academy. And hopefully by then, I've talked Mr. Penn into getting me some money so I can do the field house. We'll talk later. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So with that, uh, I guess we should talk a little bit about C.C. Griffin. Out of those 19 roofs I just told you about, C.C. Griffin is the only one we've ever had any real issues with during the process. Don't believe that was the contractor that's doing the roofing. We believe that's an issue with the application of the fireproofing inside the school. I don't see it as any immediate problem. We are, as of today, talking to a contractor, an engineer to come in, do a survey on the entire school and look at what it's going to take to repair what's fallen off. And honestly, because that roof went so long, leaking the way it was, that water incursion had a huge part of it. It's not anything dangerous, just something we need to repair. And I'm telling you that because I'm probably going to come and ask for money for it later. Any questions? Any questions, board members? Ms. Escobar. Thank you. We like roofs, um, and I'm, I'm learning that. Uh, I can, can I just ask that this agenda get updated to include um, the Irvin, because that wasn't in, on the list. Yes, ma'am. And I just want to make sure that we have a record of the work that we're doing. So, so thank you. Irvin wasn't on the list? It wasn't on the agenda it's list. It's on the agenda, but I'll, I'll make sure it's put on there. Okay. That may be my fault. That's okay. I just want to make sure we capture what we're doing. Thank Might you. not have my glasses on. You know. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. We appreciate yes, it. Yeah, okay, you're gonna stay up here. Okay. Can't so we're gonna move. That easy. <laughs> we're gonna move to 7.01, and these are items for consent, approval of the CCHS parking lot repair bids. 
and Dr. Bowers, were you coming up for this or? Oh, he's gonna let you do he it by yourself. Me. All right. <laughs> okay, well, go for it. So, with the parking lot repair at Central Cabarrus, uh, don't imagine anyone here that's ever ridden through that parking lot would argue that it needs to be repaired. Uh, this is only a partial replacement. That's why it was on the 25 to 499. We do that a lot of times because we know the county can't always fund the complete replacements. So we want to keep it on their radar that we need at least some repair to keep going. And in 2024, you guys approved this budget project through the budget process and the county funded it. Now I'm asking you to approve the bid. It came in at actually 405,456.98, which was over our budget. Uh, as per our state statute, when we don't have enough money, we're allowed to negotiate with the contractor. And he said, yes, sir, it's no problem at all. If you've got 386.617.10, we can do it for that. So they agreed to it. And I believe you have a letter attached in your agenda items. Any questions? Any questions, board members? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Board members, is everyone in agreement to add this item to the consent agenda for our April 15th business session? Okay. We'll move to 7.02, 10 year capital plan presentation with Mr. Tim Lauder. Good evening. Good evening, Madam Chairman members of the board, uh, Dr. Kapicki. Uh, it's my pleasure today to come to you and um, I think Chuck left his glasses. But anyway, <clears throat> to come to you today to offer you the, the capital improvement uh, plan for Cabarrus County for a 23-24 year. Um, one thing I'd like to, I guess I get to do my own sequence in here. I'm going to be asking you, how do we develop the capital improvement plan? There are several factors that come into play when we're looking at the, developing the plan itself. One, obviously, is very important is funding. You know, if Cabarrus County cannot fund it, then there's no use to put it on the list. So we have to look at that and what sequence it falls within that based on the funding. Obviously, the age of facilities. We, we look at those age facilities, and you know, we had some uh, uh, reports given to us this year. A lot more information came to us this year with uh, cooperative strategies coming in and, and giving us the FCI on all of our schools and, and giving us some uh, recommendations of what we need to do based on age facilities and growth also in the county. We look at our school boundaries and our feeder patterns. That changed significantly this year, obviously, with your approval of the new boundaries. And that offers some areas where we had some capacity and some others where we don't have that capacity. So it, it also prioritizes some of our projects based on where we have to know uh, additional seats need to be in that district or whatever it may be. The growth projections, again, that we just talked about. We've got some pretty serious growth projections. We, we always talk about how many students we grow every year. That's one thing that's a factor, but the most important factor is where do we grow? You know, where are they? Or where are they coming from? Because that really does affect where the school facilities have to go. And then we look at we look at functionality of the schools, the school functioning as it should. You know, some of our schools were built with not a whole lot of self-contained classrooms in them. And now some of them have four. Well, you know, that, that's a that's different in function of what it's designed to be. So we have to look at that as well when we start looking at sequencing of our capital projects and whether we'll build additional facilities with certain types of facilities based upon our program that have, might have changed over the last 10 to 15 years when that school was built. School capacity, that's obviously everybody looks at that. You need seats. Where do we need seats? That's really a big factor. It's probably one of the big factors. And now, more and more importantly, land availability. As you, can, as you know, in our high growth areas, it is harder and harder to find even a parcel that's only 20 acres for an elementary school, let alone a parcel that's 100 acres. Fortunately, Cabarrus County has recognized that allow us to land bank things. So we do have a couple sites that are land bank for us, some of our larger parcels, and hopefully we'll continue to be able to do that as we move forward. Then we talk about our goals and how we sequence everything. We have to prioritize our projects, uh, not only to just meet the, the students' needs, but also to be development of Cabarrus County and, and what Cabarrus County government can provide the funding for. So that's very, very important when we start sequencing our projects. And we also adjust those uh, sequences every year based on new factors. This year, we have quite a few new factors to be able to look at sequencing our projects. One, we have completed quite a few projects. We also have some priorities 
talking about where the population growth is going to be and recommendations of having to add two new elementary schools as well as replacing several of our aged schools with the FCI index of, uh, much higher than you know, 60 to 80 percent. We also look uh, to uh, adjust our sequency based on major changes in, in conditions at the school. You know, we have some failures at the school. We have some problems at the school. You know, those are things we have to look at as we look forward to what next project comes in the sequence. And then, like I say, probably one of the most important factors is Cabarrus County would like to have a prioritization and a heads up on what kind of capital request we're going to make. And that was really the reason you saw the chart that had the 12 uh, different sequence patterns on there. Cabarrus County wanted to say, it's, if you can give me a heads up, the quicker the better. We can start planning on the future of that funding because it does require quite a bit of effort on their part to be able to come up with sometimes two and three or four hundred million dollars. <clears throat> Again, developing the priorities. We, we talked about one of our issues with um, the strategic plan from cooperative strategies. Some of our aging facilities, prioritizing replacing those. We have to balance that with the fact that we have a lot of growth as well. We've always tried to balance that. And that's why some of our aging facilities are in the condition they are is because we had to put so much priority on growth, we didn't have the funds to be able to continue to upgrade and, 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 and improve those schools as we should have uh, 20, 25 years ago. Now it's almost too late, so we have to look at that sort of thing. Also, prioritization of the northwest and southwest portions of the county, which we are projecting to have the highest growth. Right now we have schools that are still at 100% and some of them 125% knowing waiting on the next elementary school to be built in both of those areas. So that definitely affects the priority we put on the capital project. Now nothing would be better if we need to go back and look at what we did last year. Some of the questions are why does this change so much every year? Well if you looked last year Here's our sequencing plan. We had R. Brown McAllister. Uh, we had the purchase of land at Southern Cabarrus High School, the Cabarrus Health Science Institute, Royal Oaks Arts High School Edition. We asked that. It was a request last year. The Opportunity School and the renovations to R. Brown McAllister for, to accept Mary Frances Wall. And plus number seven, which was a big project there. We, cut, we left a lot of capital projects in on that thing, which is sports fields, some roofs, and some uh, HVAC projects and that sort of thing in one big package. They funded most of that, with the, with the exception of the, um, some auditorium additions that we had asked for for several years and still has not been funded. But if you look at that, this year we have R. Brown McAllister to purchase land in Southern High School, Cabarrus Health Science Institute as well in the way and be opened up in August. The Royal Oaks Arts uh, High School did not receive funding, and based on discussions, we have taken that off the list because we don't feel like that's going to be funded anytime in the near future because we do look at other opportunities to meet that need. And we had the Opportunity School as well as number seven, the facilities needs. All those projects were funded. So obviously, they can move off of the sequence and allowing other projects to move in with the sequence. Now, the Opportunity School and the renovation for um, our, from Mary Frances Wall will remain on it because those projects are just at the beginning. I always try to keep the projects on the cycle until we're well into the project knowing it's fixing the end because I want to make sure they recognize that they're still ongoing projects. Again, this is the sequencing pattern. This is, a property, this is the information we have to provide to Cabarrus County. This is what they want to know. This is a priority we have set based on last year's prioritization, and this is the amount of money we need. And they can begin to plan on how they can fund our needs. Let's move to this year's sequencing. Again, significantly different than what we just saw. Opportunity School goes to first and also the pre-K center for Mary Frances Wall. Those moved to the head of the pack. They were funded last year. They were guaranteed funded last year in the, in the budget with Cabarrus County. They're going to construction this year. We'll get money for them in this, this July cycle. Also, we looked at replacements for the elementary school at Culture and Webb and a new elementary school for growth. Last year, you noticed the Northwest Cabarrus High School was ahead of those projects on six, and the new elementary school did not appear on, on the list at all because, again, we were still trying to go to the, replacing the aged schools and a new high school for growth. But with our analysis and our strategic plan, we provided with cooperative strategies that your highest priority is fixing these aged schools and adding two new elementary schools, that's your first priority, and they should be because of the growth you're going to see. Thus, 
this capital plan follows that sequencing. <coughs> Again, we had some people concerned that we did not have Beverly Hills on the sequencing plan. It, it disappeared a couple years ago because some of the other priorities moved forward because of the funding. We couldn't get much traction on that project. When Cabarrus County said, that's just not a project we're willing to fund at this point in time. We recognize, though, that those facilities need to be replaced. We were already in a, a, a cultural web was down the list significantly last year as well because we had no place to put it. We have searched for land for three years trying to find an alternative site to place Culture and Web uh, Elementary School. But with a completion of the Harbour McAllister, we have a window of opportunity. Since we cannot find additional land to build Culture and Web, the only logical place to put it is back on Culture and Web Elementary School site. But our dilemma was we had no place to put the kids. So if we did not renovate it for Mary Frances Wall and allowed it to be the swing school, then we could move the kids from Culture and Web onto that site, be housed for two years, and then allow us to build Culture and Web, which moved it up in the priority significantly to allow us to hit that window of opportunity to have available space for those kids. Okay? But it also gave us the opportunity to expand that school at Culture and Web Elementary School to be able to house the students the 750 students that they told us it was going to be the, the population we could expect in the next 10 years in the downtown area to build that school large enough to do that to be able to accept the kids from not only Cultural Web but some of the kids back from Beverly Hills to be able to go into that school. So that's why that moved up in sequence in that priority. So again, as you can see, a new elementary school for growth, both of those did not appear last year but they have to appear this year because of our priority situation. The Southern Cabarrus High School, that's one that's on the list. And we also have the replacement elementary school because they said we need a third one. We don't know where it's going to go yet. That's four or five years down the road, and we will determine where that needs to be based on those priorities I just talked about. But then you also have Central Cabarrus High School. That's a big question. Central Cabarrus High School, Southern High School. That's really going to depend <coughs> on the growth. If the growth comes, is projected in the Midland area, then that may be the Southern High School might be the first priority allowing us to be that school built there because it would be more central to the population of the Central Cabarrus district. And then that would become basically a replacement for Central Cabarrus, allow the kids to move into that school and then replace Central Cabarrus after they've all been moved and that campus is vacated and we're allowed to work on a campus without kids on the campus. However, if the growth does not come into effect in the southern portion of the county and it continues to grow in the center of the county, that still becomes the central portion of the population base it may be more advantageous to put Central Cabarrus on its existing site first. So again, that shows you there'll be a future opportunity for those sequences to change based upon the dynamics of that time. Okay. Again, as you sequence, we have our budget uh, list here. One thing that I will note change is the number one opportunity school. Mr. Penn just uh, pointed out to you that we had a request to Cabarrus County at $2.5 million of that request was for opportunity school. We found we had a budget gap there because once we went in and sequenced that um, program, that facility, and determined how much square footage we needed and trimmed it as much as we could, our first pricing uh, operation said we do not have enough money in the budget to, to build that facility. And we told Cabarrus County that immediately, said thank you for letting us know that. We will try to work that into our capital finance this year so you can get that hole and begin that project. So that's. That was a good, that's, that's another good example of why it is very important to let them know immediately once you see there's a change in budget so they can help you out with that budget shortfall. Okay. And with that, I'm looking for questions. Mr. Floyd, do you have a question? Yeah, I wanted to start here and then I'll defer to everybody else. On the sequencing, I kind of thought Northwest uh, High School and Middle School or more of a, a project to do simultaneously. Is it, <coughs> why doesn't it make sense to do it, do them simultaneously and spread them out? Well, Northwest Cabarrus High School, that had to be first. Right. Because once we built Northwest Cabarrus High School, then we vacate it, mm -hmm. then we would be able to go in and rebuild on that site with the Northwest Cabarrus Middle School. So they have, one has to come prior to the other. I guess why the big gap? The big gap from 5 to 11. <clears throat> One, 
Northwest Cabarrus High School was moved down to priority. That was our first on the list last year. If you know the next coming in sequence, they hadn't already been funded. But Cabarrus County says, I am not able to fund that high school in this, this funding cycle. It's just too large of a project, but I can fund you two elementary schools and help you out with your opportunity school property. So therefore it moved Northwest Cabarrus High School down prior to this. But once North Carolina, that would not be done for almost four years now, from now. So in between that four years, there's other things that need to probably take place prior to the, us being given the opportunity to start on the Northwest Cabarrus Middle School. And if you recall, cooperative strategy says we're pretty whole in middle school seats uh, for the next 10 years. So that moves that a little bit farther down the priority because of not needing the seats in that particular area. Okay, that yes, sir. Ms. Sandage. So, I, and maybe I've been asleep for a little bit, but for Rosa, there was a, a great need and there's been a great need to change that from um, K through eight. And this might be a Dr. Kapicki question. Um, and then what happened for it not to be any longer? Well, uh, one, um, when we went to Cabarrus County for funding on that project, they were not really enthusiastic about adding additional funds to that particular location. Um, but I know Dr. Kapicki had quite a bit of uh, uh, discussion with them about the high school and how we could further be able to provide the opportunity for kids in the arts program to go to high school. So I uh, might help address that. Yeah, I, I don't, so I don't think that, well, I don't think, we will, we will continue to pursue making that a K-12 art school, um, but for this year, the sequencing is as you see it. Uh, I think Mr. Lauder made a lot of great points when he showed you the previous year and then this year and how fluid this thing is and how much it changes from year to year. Right now, I think the growth is the bigger priority. That doesn't mean that we are giving up on the Royal Oaks. Um, expanding to a high school because we are not so that that is still a a strong um future plan but right now what you see in front of you is demanding our attention because of the growth um, we really need to address some of that first but we will continue to pursue other options and continue to make that that heart that high school priority k to 12. So did I understand correctly that the county didn't want to fund? They were not enthusiastic about funding. Oh, okay. Okay. They, so that's yeah. different from us changing because of, and this is just my interpretation, that's different from us changing because we need seats somewhere else. Um, there, I, from what I've under, understood, there has been no issue at filling ROSA because oh, there is no, such a great demand no, for no. the arts. Not, not at all, and, and quite the contrary. If, if we if we built that to a K-12, then we'll have no trouble making that a K-12 facility, and we will continue to pursue that goal. Um, I don't want to lose. I don't want to make it appear that we've given up on it because the county was not that excited about it last year. It's just that th there are other priorities right now that demand our attention, but we will not give up on trying to make that a K-12 school. Uh, one thing I will point out, though, it is one of our smaller budgeted projects. So it is kind of a pocket project, okay? So as we get funding and we have a gap, we say we they get $100 million available, we need 80. And we, we'll try to pull that one into that cycle, even though it may not even be on the list that year, right. because it's a pocket project that we can still fund within the limits of their funding. So it doesn't necessarily need to be on this list to make it a something we can do, is what I understand. It doesn't Correct. mean that we don't have it in our radar and we still right. won't do it. Which gives me a thousand more questions that I'll save for another day. <laughs> um, the, the last question I had kind of alludes or kind of piggybacks on that. So from what I understand, and y'all please correct me if I'm wrong, that we tell the county, this is what we want to fund for this cycle, right? And then they come back to us and they say, yes, on certain things, or they just give us a lump sum of money and they determine, well, we, you have to do these things based off of this. And then other monies we can put somewhere else. Do I understand that correctly? We have some discretion on how we use the money and where we use it. <clears throat> but then again, most of our capital projects are funded based on project description. This is the project we're going to build for this. If I told him I was going to build a school in this location and they gave me the money for it and I turned out and did totally, totally different, we would probably have a problem next time I went to ask for money. So we do try to make sure that once we have identified this is a project you're going to fund me, I'm going to build that project. So you just answered my question halfway. 
where, where do I identify as a board member or somebody from the public? Where do they identify how we determined that set of money that they didn't say you got to use for this? Where does someone identify who or how that was determined to be used for that specific thing? I hope that made sense because you're looking at me crazy. You're saying when they give me, say they give me $20 million, right. no designation. I would love them for that, but they have not ever done that to me. Okay, they've always given me money <laughs> for mm. a specific purpose. Okay, so they really don't. And, and the capital side, I, I don't really. You say, well, I get an extra twenty million dollars out of there if you just want to throw it at a project. I'd love to let you do that. They, they haven't really done that for us. I, it would be nice, and that would be very, very nice if we've got a full pocket of money and said, hey, you as a school board, you determine where you spend that money. We don't care. But that's not really the case so, either. So. I'm understanding now the counties we say hey county this is what we would like to do they say hey we're going to give you this school district and we want you to use it for this what we normally do is I go this is my priorities and this is what we wish to do county says I understand that but in this funding cycle I may or may not be able to do that what are your other priorities? And they know our priorities, we've given them to them. We said, well, if I move these two schools up, can you fund those two schools this cycle, knowing, recognizing you may not be able to, <coughs> say, fund $125 million for a high school, but you can give me $100 million for two elementaries. That's $25 million gap right there. And they said, in this cycle, I can. Well, then, obviously, I'm going to move my sequence to allow me to use that money because they said they can give it to me now. And I'll delay the high school until next cycle so I can get the 125 then. Now, that, 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 that happens a lot, and that's what usually happens. Most of the time, it's, it's more of a negotiation, if you will, back and forth as to how much funding they will give us. And they've been very, very, very receptive to our, our request. Yeah, they haven't funded 100% of everything we've asked for, right. but they've done a really, really good job. I think you need to think in terms of two, the three, the three buckets. So there's three buckets that the county puts the money in. So what you see here is our, I would call our most expensive bucket, which is our capital improvement plans, which is how the county goes on their, their, borrow, their borrowing cycle every two years. They sequence for every two years their borrowing cycle, and that's where we get our big bucket projects, our schools and our things of that nature on this, this capital sequencing that you see. The second bucket we get every year is between those projects between 25000 and half a million dollars that our, our facilities team manages with Dr. Bowers and Chuck and Tim, et cetera. Then you have what, you know, the other bucket that Phil presented this evening. We talked a little bit about how the um, projects that are less than 25000 if you recall, that, that money initially when we first presented to you was like $1.5 million, and then the, the county has traditionally given us $1,020,000. Um, for those projects, and uh, Mr. Penn outlined today how we got that down to that price. So if you think of the three buckets, generally speaking, bucket one we get, bucket three, which would I would say be this bucket, we get a piece of this depending on what their borrowing cycle is and what the priorities are, and then bucket two, the 25499 is always one that I think has a little more flexibility in terms of what they give us. By that, I mean you just... You know, we could do all ways and say, here's what we got over a five or ten year period, but that's when it's a little more unpredictable, if you will. Um, this one's fairly predictable because they're going to tell us what we get point blank. We know we're getting the one million twenty thousand dollars. It's that second tier bucket, but the twenty five thousand four ninety nine that's a little uncertain. And that's where you were saying, based off of what they agreed to fund, this may change. In the bucket number three, they, what were they, this changes when they, in the next cycle, they come to us and say, I only have $80 million worth of borrowing capacity. <coughs> that may change the sequence because we literally Thank can't you. fund that project. Thank you. Ms. Escobar. Thank you. Thank you for the explanation. Um, I felt like we really needed it uh, just because I just remember the list that we shared with our county commissioners back in February. And so I just want to make sure that we're being consistent. And I know you are. So thank you for the explanation. Um, I will just say I don't like seven where it is. Um, and and there's a lot of things swirling in my head right, right now. But I'll just go back to the arts programming. Um, we have two high schools that don't have auditoriums. 
that can't like or that aren't that great in comparison to their counterparts. And so when you talk about programming and arts and and I just feel like Central uh, Cabarrus and Northwest Cabarrus, they, they need they need new schools sooner rather than later. And I understand we have to put elementary first because that's where the demand is, but these kids are gonna go to, the elementary school kids are gonna have these amazing facilities and then they're gonna get to high school and be like, what happened? Um, and the growth, the reality is, is the growth is in Northwest and Southwest. And I just don't see what's going on over in Midland. And I, I know it's coming. I know they're gonna get approved for stuff and all that, but I mean, we have really big needs I would argue at um, both Northwest and Central, and I just don't think Central should be at 12. And I don't understand why we're talking about building new high school when we, when Central, you can keep those kids in the school and you can build on that land still, and so you don't need a swing school for them. Um, so anyway, that would just be my like my plea is just let's let's think about the kids we have right now and how you're setting them up for expectation. I mean, I just walked our Brown today um, with the interns and it's so nice. I mean, it's just like these kids are just, it, I'm so happy for them. Um, but what are we doing to our high schoolers? Um, they, deserve, they deserve to have state-of-the-art facilities too. And, um, and I just think that we need to be um, looking at what we've done. And, and I feel like that's what we've done with our elementary schools. Like we, we were told by the consultants we need to have elementary schools um, and we need to build new ones and renovate our old ones. And we chose to renovate first and then build. And I would suggest we do the same thing with the high schools. Let's renovate our two that really need it and then then build. But that, that's, that's just my suggestion. But I appreciate the explanation for, for everything else. And I recognize that you could switch 7 and 12 um, after this budget cycle and we find out that things could change. Um, but that would be my preference. And, and I will explain a little bit why Southern High School might appear earlier. Because right now, Central Barish High School is at the very, very northern boundary of their district. That means 75% of their kids travel a very long distance to get there. If I replace Central Barris in the Southern High School, moves it more toward the central portion of their boundary and then all kids don't travel as much to get to a new high school. I get to a new high school. It just is not on Central Cabarrus' site. It still has Central Cabarrus' site then to come back and build at a later date to be able to pick up more kids from the central area as the area grows. And South South grows even more and starts pushing kids away having to create more, more demand in the center portion of the county. Does that make sense? Ms. Lindsay. Thank you uh, for the presentation. I do have a question. Um, the opportunity scholarship that the state of North Carolina is offering now, from my understanding, we have a lot of kids and parents that have applied for that opportunity scholarship. Do we know how many kids from Cabarrus County um, have, have done that and the potential for those kids to be no longer in our school system? You're talking about the opportunity tax scholarship program? Correct. Yeah. Um, right now we do not. Uh, we will definitely be looking at that over the next, between the end of school year, beginning of school year, because that will definitely, if it does impact our enrollments, we're going to know that over the summer. Yeah. Um, right now, uh, right now our, our enrollment is stable, but um, th this will be the year that we take a hard look at, at how much that impacts okay. us. I just wanted to keep that on yeah. our radar. Yes, ma'am. To be looking at. Um, and also, I kind of wanted to echo too, and, and I, I understand your explanation for the Southern High School, I do, but I also understand that Central Cabarrus has been waiting for a very long time uh, to get a high school. So, you know, I, I do think that we should probably move that up on the, on the priority list. And it would come, as soon as we get Northwest, it's right there as well. So. Yes, and Northwest as well, so thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Everyone in agreement to add this to the consent agenda for April 15th business session? I would like it on the action. Okay. Action noted. Okay, board members will move to 7.03. This is our 24-25 calendars for our research schools with Dr. Jonathan Bowers and our principals. 
Good evening. Good evening once again, Madam Chair, members of the board, and Dr. Kapicki. Um, I'm joined by some esteemed guests here with me at the uh, podium tonight. I've got the principals from our restart schools. Um, as you recall, we came before the board back in January to ask for there to be uh, consideration for their a continued participation in restart for our five restart schools. Those schools had met the criteria set forth by the North Carolina Department of Public Instruction to be able to continue to operate under the auspices of restart. Uh, if you remember that restart itself, what it does is it affords these schools um, some particular latitudes that don't exist within other schools themselves. Uh, restart is a form of a reform model that is offered by the state. Uh, it allows for schools essentially who have been granted said authorization to be able to operate with charter-like flexibilities. Uh, and those flexibilities really allow for the school to be able to make some local decisions to drive some of the instructional programming, uh, some of the flexibility options, some of the staffing options, and some of the budgetary options that are in, case, are in place for them to drive school improvement. Um, really, the goal is to increase uh, overall the number of schools that would meet or exceed growth uh, based on student uh, performance at the end of each year. Uh, the schools that we do have participate and do have those listed, we've got Concord Middle School represented by Dr. Jonathan here tonight. We've got Royal Oak School of the Arts represented by Ms. Marsh. We have Weinkauf Elementary represented by Ms. Rod. We have Rocky River Elementary represented by Ms. Butch. And then we have Irvin Elementary represented by Dr. Wells. Each of these are phenomenal principals among the many phenomenal principals we have here in Cabarrus County Schools doing great work each and every day. So just to be able to touch upon some of the flexibilities that are afforded to our research schools, I've outlined those there for you. There are some budget flexibilities to which they do have the means to be able to operate without some of the restrictions that come in place with some of the coding and some of the actual allocations that exist from a fiscal standpoint. You have an employment requirement um, exception. Uh, these particular principals here are able to waive some of the actual licensure requirements for some staff members to serve in key or critical roles. And it does help for us to be able to get highly qualified now. There are qualified individuals in front of students to be able to serve their needs, but it allows for there to be the immediacy of placement without necessarily having the licensure in hand. And in many cases, these individuals work towards licensure, work towards certification so that they continue to be able to be employed within the school. Calendar flexibility is one we bring here before you tonight with a request. Standard course of study, we don't see this one that is practiced much. That actually, if rarely, is practiced across the state of North Carolina. And then assessment is another one. We just don't see many uses of that in play because many of the end-of-year assessments are driven by the state itself, and there is an expectation that all schools participate. Um, all five of our schools, and I think this is to be noteworthy, noted, all five of our schools have been recommended for continued reauthorization. And I haven't done the data, I haven't necessarily talked to other districts, but I knew though that it is rare for all districts to have this number of schools continue to be allowed to uh, participate uh, in the program and restart uh, uh, model uh, for the next five year cycle. So it, it speaks to the work that's being done uh, within the buildings and the work that's being done with leadership here. Two of our restart schools uh, were not on the low performing list this past year, and I think that speaks again to the efforts that are taking place within the school level and the work that's being done by our staff. Um, certainly our students working hard and really rising to the level of expectations have been put in place. And we even have one of our restart schools that has exited recurring low performing identification. So again, these are some noteworthy accomplishments. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Wells. He's going to speak to you a little bit about each of the school's accomplishments and where they stand from a uh, sort of a progression standpoint. All right. Thank you, Dr. Bowers. Uh, first off, I want to start off by saying that, man, a lot can happen in a year. Uh, last year, I was last in the batting order. I had finished my first month at Irvin. I was told we had, I had restart flexibility. But I didn't really know what that meant. I was uh, notified about this board meeting, and they said, I said, I will show up, I'll smile, and I'll tell, say what you tell me to. <laughs> so they said, you can be the thank you guy. So I was, I was like, okay. Uh, but one thing that I did say at that meeting is I was looking forward to learning about restart flexibilities and how we can levy those uh, flexibilities uh, to, to <coughs> meet students' needs at our school. All right, and so this year I get to talk, I moved up in the batting order, and I get to talk about uh, the big question, did restart flexibility improve student outcomes over time? Uh, and the data demonstrates here that we have, uh, all schools did qualify, like Dr. Bauer said earlier, but the paths may have been different. And so Royal Oaks, congratulations to Ms. Marsh. 
uh, off of the recurring low performing schools list. Uh, also, we have Weinkauf who exceeded expected growth. So both of those schools are off of the low performing schools list for this year. Uh, and then the other schools, uh, they, we used a combination of our school growth scores uh, and our subgroup growth status and progress with flexibility outcomes. And so the big takeaway that I'm just reiterating what Dr. Bauer said is that we uh, did demonstrate that we used restart flexibility uh, and we did qualify to, um, for continuation by meeting the state established criteria. Uh, I also want to say, just like I said at the last meeting a year ago, that I am looking forward to continuing to explore how we can levy these flexibilities to change outcomes for students. And also I have some great news. There's a new thank you person and I hear she's way better than the, last, the guy last year. Um, good evening everyone. Um, so I'm going to quickly uh, talk about the continued um, requests that we have. So employment flexibility and budget flexibility, those are two besides the calendar flexibility that we utilize. And um, both these, both of these are extremely beneficial um, to all of our schools uh, in Restart. So employment flexibility, like Dr. Bowers had said, um, it kind of opens up the pathway for, for individuals who may not, have a, or may not have a licensure yet, but are on the pathway to licensure. But what it really does is we have a larger candidate pool that we can kind of dive into, um, and especially with, with um, you know, candidate pool that we currently have with, um, with, uh, with our situation with education in general, um, we're always looking for ways that we can hire and retain quality people. Um, so definitely looking at flexibility with um, with our employment and looking at not only people that are on the pathway to licensure, but like we have, for example, we hired uh, an individual at Concord Middle School, and I know this individual is gonna be a phenomenal teacher. Um, has a four-year degree, not necessarily in education, but it just opened up the pathway for her. And she said, I always wanted to be a teacher, but I didn't go to school, and I just didn't know the right way to get into it. And so um, that's just one example of, of I think, how um, it opens the door and kind of you know, opens the candidate pool for us. And then budget flexibility. So within our restart budget uh, and our state budget, um, we really have the opportunity that other schools don't have to move money within within our state budget. So for example, if all of a sudden mid, midway through the year we realize we really wanna engage staff in a specific professional development, we can move money from like materials and supplies into our professional, but into our professional development um, uh, line code and then we can utilize that money so it really helps with um, with flexibility across how we spend money based on whatever um, our school needs uh, for that year and, and for that for that point of time so all right good evening and thank you for allowing us to be here today to talk about our restart flexibilities and the continuation of some of those um, one that is most important to us is our continuation of the calendar restart flexibility um, we sincerely appreciate the board support the past two years in allowing us to add three additional half days to our calendar um, this would be for restart schools only um, and again we're asking for that going forward for the next school year so the proposed dates for our um, half days for the 2024-25 school year are September 20th, January 31st, and March 28th. And so elementary schools would dismiss at 12 o'clock as usual on an early dismissal day, and Concord Middle would dismiss at 1 o'clock again as usual on an early dismissal day. And these days would afford us to have school level professional development to support our individual school goals and our um, restart initiatives. Um, we do think that this is an investment in our teachers and this investment in our teachers will reap dividends in our student outcomes. We know that our teachers work really hard. Uh, we ask them to do a, a lot of things, not just us as restart principals, but all principals. Teachers are asking, uh, principals are asking teachers to do a lot because the job demands a lot. And I think if you ask any teacher what they need, the majority of them will say they need time. And the work days that are already in the calendar are taken up with very important work that they do need to accomplish, such as you know grading, report cards, parent-teacher conferences, planning field trips, um, all important things. Um, if we add these three additional half days to our calendar, this gives us dedicated time to do the important work of our school initiatives, in my case, um, the arts. And so it allows us to reserve those dates and not 
put the arts training on our staff on already packed days. So we're not adding additional things to our teacher's plate without removing something, if that makes sense. It allows our teachers the opportunity to come together to not only learn about our school initiatives, but also collaborate across grade levels and um, provide time to refine the work in, in what we do. And so again, uh, the, the days that we are proposing for the upcoming school year are September 20th, January 31st, and March 28th. You may notice that these dates are all on Fridays. Um, in the past, these dates have not always been on Fridays, but some of our schools received some feedback from parents that because traditionally the half days are on Fridays in the calendar, they would prefer to see the half days on Fridays because that is a little more in their norm. And so we did accommodate th those requests. But in general, we've received very good feedback from our parents. Um, I know my parents specifically have asked, what are we using these dates for? And we communicate that to our families and our families are very appreciative that we are pouring into our teachers and giving them time to um, learn the work of what we do in our schools. And so um, when, kind of to echo, first thank you so much for your time this evening um, and for affording us the opportunity to um, bring this request to you again. Um, but to kind of echo what Melody said, um, in looking at the dates that we looked at this year, a lot of, um, we work a lot with our partnerships both within the district and outside of the district. So when we um, met to kind of look at these dates and propose some potential dates for our students, um, one of the first things that we did was we reached out to transfer transportation, we reached out to child nutrition, um, and we also um, reached out to Kids Plus because those are um, services that we need for our kids to be able to get home. We need to make sure that they're fed. We need to make sure that our students who go to after school um, have the opportunity to be able to do that. And so um, in communication with um, those individuals, all of those individuals have indicated that the dates that we have proposed, they did not see a problem with those um, in terms of um, allowing, making sure we have buses, making sure that Kids Plus staff is available at all of our elementary schools um, to staff those children. Um, we also, um, each of us have a very strong partnership with the Boys and Girls Club, um, also reached out to them as well. They are very gracious in their support within all of our schools. And so um, I know my school has two buses of students that go to the Boys and Girls Club. Um, and they have agreed again, they've done it the last two years, again have said they are more than happy to provide students um, that transportation um, pending that this is approved. So um, we've also, I know at Rocky River, we have several other daycares and daycare vans that come and pick up our students. And so um, a lot of it is just, again, communication with those um, agencies and those um, daycare uh, facilities, just like it is communication with our parents. We ensure that we communicate our calendar. Um, a lot of times what we found is we may need an extra reminder to the daycare van that, hey, tomorrow, don't forget, is an early release day for these schools. Um, but again, we um, feel like we have very strong partnerships and um, both inside and outside of the county that support the work that we are doing um, with our teachers on these additional days. I guess I'm the closer. Thank you <laughs> so much for your support. I'm Carol Rod, I'm the new principal, or the new interim principal, excuse me, at Weinkoff. So did you all have any questions that my colleagues and I can answer? We're so grateful for your support. Ms. Sandage. So, Dr. Bowers, you um, uh, brought a point up that, that I just want to make sure you clarify out loud. So you said this gives us charter school-like opportunities. So we've got over 40 schools and only five of them are, are able to operate like a charter school or yes, similar to a charter school. Um, I just, for me, that's profound that all of our schools have to go through these rigorous requirements and we've got schools um, that are, you know, charter schools that do not have to. I appreciate you all explaining and breaking that down for us because I understand how this helps the students at those specific schools. Couple questions. Um, so when you have the calendar flexibility, I know you said you work with different partners within the area. Are these all of the partners that would be somewhat affected by those changes in the calendar? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yes, it is. So, and we communicate with our families. We give the calendar out at the beginning of the year. Um, we post reminders on Parent Square, social media, um, and we work with everybody that supports our students. And that's for all of the five schools? Yes, Those are the same days yes, across the board? Yes, okay, good, yes, thanks. 
Um, and then when you talk about teacher certification, so for example, I want us to just fully clarify the folks that are teaching the kids. I just want to make sure we communicate that they are they should be in those spaces, if that makes sense. Because when you hear that someone is teaching a class that doesn't have a certification, you start to think, well, maybe they don't need to be in front of those kids. Are there specific things that those folks go through, like training, et cetera, or is it the same as teachers? And I hope I'm making sense. Yes, I just want us to fully clarify. So I'm going to defer to the principals as to what they use within their respective buildings in each location. I can only give you my personal experience as a principal having served in this capacity. So again, for example, when I would have a situation where I made it a social studies teacher, I would find someone who was a history major who had the content knowledge, and then that individual was fully prepared for said instruction in that particular situation. And then we worked through the licensure process with that individual. So it allowed for that. Another one in which I used as well would have been a situation where we had a math opening and a lot of business teachers have strong math backgrounds. So I was able to actually leverage that such that those individuals could assist along the way as they pursued licensure to pr become a teacher. So um, content wise, preparation, preparation wise and support wise, there were internal structures built in and the district in which again, I served at the time for this had an onboarding program for those that were new to the profession, much as new teacher training, new teacher orientation and new employee training. So they would get the requisite training and preparation for acclimating to an educational environment. And I'll defer to Ms. Marks for how she may use that at her school. Sure, I wanted to give an example of how we're currently using this at Royal Oaks. Um, many of you know Amy Lynn Foster, our middle school theater teacher. Um, she directs the um, third through eighth grade performances at our school. Currently, she has a K-6 teaching license. Her background is in teaching kindergarten. She is not licensed to teach theater, but as many of you know, she is absolutely perfect at that job, and she is the right person for that job. Without Restart Flexibility, we would not be able to have her teach our middle school students theater. So that is a wonderful example. Um, we also had our dance teacher. She is fully licensed now, but when we hired her, she did not have a teaching degree in dance. She was pursuing a dance degree, but was not yet finished with her teaching degree. So we were able to go ahead and hire her as she continued her coursework. And then of course, she's finished now and fully licensed to teach dance in the school setting. Other principals may have other examples. And that is not a requirement. Like that's not a state requirement. This process that you've explained to us is not a state requirement that we have to do it this way. So like you just explained, you would try to find somebody with a history background. Yes, ma'am, that's that, correct. Okay, and I just wanna reiterate again that this is a charter school model. You mm -hmm. do not have to, I'm just trying to hit this point home. Charter schools have people or teachers that are teaching, potentially teaching subjects that don't correlate with anything that they have learned. And we as a public education entity have implemented processes that make sure we are coupling teachers with things that are at least within their background. I understand that correctly? That's a very articulate way of saying it. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Okay. Thank you. My last point is this, or a question is this. So when you talk about we've been, these five schools have been recommended to continue. Yes, ma'am. Where do those recommendations come from and what do they base it on? So there was, and I know it's sometimes difficult to think back presentations because you've seen a lot over the months and things of that nature. So there was a pathway, there was a workflow kind of a flow chart that was presented back in January that showed that these schools were now at the last year of what is their reevaluation year. The, you, you spoke about the, you know, why these five schools. When Restart was first made available to school districts across the state of North Carolina, cohort one started in 2016, 2017. Schools that were eligible for consideration for those that had been identified as recurring low performing. And low performing at that time or recurring is defined as two out of any three years a school does not have a school performance grade of, you know, anything, you know, a, a school performance grade of A, B, or C, or if the school had a school performance grade of D or F, that they did not exceed growth. So they had the criteria in place. So at the time, uh, these were those schools that were eligible. 
And so through the application process, they were granted the opportunity to participate in the restart model. Since that time, the state of North Carolina was going to document, chart, and monitor the restart model progress to determine whether or not the flexibilities we've spoken to tonight do indeed yield greater student outcomes and produce measurables such that we see student success. And I would say, again, with leadership here and their staffs, that this is a testament to in Cabarrus County, and I can only speak to that, what they're doing is working. And I think, again, that's hats off to them for being um, able to leverage this at their disposal. So now that evaluation year was this past year, and based on several key metrics, the first of which was, was the school no longer considered a recurring low performing school based on the most recent state accountability data? And for Royal Oaks, the answer to that was yes. So they then exited recurring low performing. That was an automatic Willy Wonka golden ticket card, all right? Because by virtue of doing that, they were granted continued authorization. Yes, ma'am. And then for our other schools, the metrics then were, where did they meet or exceed growth? And then there was a next tier that beyond that to say, did their achievement score change from the baseline year 2017 to this most recent year? And in some cases, yes, and others, no but that wasn't the last way to be able to be considered. It's then they looked at, well, your subgroups, how are we doing in serving subgroups within our schools? And if schools could demonstrate that 50% or more of their subgroups met or exceeded growth, that allowed them to be eligible for continued authorization. So when the board in January um, voted to approve continued authorization because they had met the metrics set forth by the state of North Carolina, that now then moves to the State Board of Education for final approval, and that you know, that becomes yet a mere formality at this point. Did I explain that? Does it make sense? You did. Thanks for the reminder, too. Okay. I can send the board the flow chart. We sent to them back in uh, December, January 2 this week in the report. Um, also, ROSA was the leading and learning uh, model that the state chose yes, this year back in December that other school districts across the state came and visited ROSA under Melody's leadership. She's done a phenomenal job over there. Um, modeling what what effective practices are of restart, as have the, the other principals that are here this evening. Um, I just point that out to say that we're, you know, we are doing it so well that you know someone like Melody is becoming the the model for us of the state to follow. So you know, I just want to remind the board of that, and again, take another opportunity to thank all of you. And Melody, great job, and Tara and Rich and Carol and, and Chris, I appreciate all the great work you're doing. So thank you. Miss Escobar. Yeah, I want to say great work. Uh, it's nice to see improvement, and um, I appreciate that you're all here with us at 8 o'clock on a Monday night because it's a long day. So thank you. Um, I, I will support this being on consent. I just want to say that I, I, I appreciate that you listen to parents because I think last time when you came before us, you were asking for Wednesdays, and now you're asking for Fridays. So I am just curious if you will notice an attendance difference um, with with your your teachers and they're great they deserve all the time that they can get i get it they don't get a lot of downtime but i'm just i hope that they're sh they show up for the for the all the work that you're putting into for this professional development so when you come back to us next year i just would be curious the com to the comparing of of that attendance data sure oh does somebody else want to say go ahead oh, yeah <laughs> So I would say, uh, and I think I'm speaking for all of my colleagues here, that so our capped work days, the capped half days are precious. These are even more precious because we have restart flexibility. Not every school does. So our teachers understand the expectation is to, to they're already there for work, and then we stay in the afternoon for professional development. Yeah, and I agree with that, and I'm sure they, they will. I'm just curious because I think some of the logic that you presented to us back last year was why Wednesdays. Um, so I, I get that it's a balancing act and there's lots of people. And so I'm just curious if you notice a difference next year. Um, but thank you so much for all you do. Any other questions, board members? Ms. Lindsay. Uh, thank you guys for your presentation and I absolutely support this as well. Um, I was just going to say that because Royal Oaks is doing so well, that also leads for it to be or move it up on the list K through 12. <laughs> <Sam. laughs> We have not given up, I assure you. <laughs> Any other questions? One, one other 
Mr. Treadway. I just want to point out that the flexibility is especially helpful for a K-8 school mm -hmm. because of certifications. I just wanted to point that out that, uh, as you pointed out, Melanie, is that uh, that's, that's a really big advantage. For, and if you go K-12, you're going to expand that. That flexibility is, is such a, 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 an opportunity. Okay, thank you guys for coming. We always welcome you to be a part of our board meetings and we appreciate your leadership. Thank you. Okay, board members, everyone in agreement to add this to our consent agenda? Okay. We'll move to 7.04, our Kids Plus budget presentation with Dr. Bowers and Amber Diggins. I promise I, I agreed to take this for her tonight. I did not necessarily <laughs> force her out by any means, but just shows you the commitment and dedication Ms. Diggins has. So, um, so uh, thank you uh, once again, uh, board members. Uh, good evening, Dr. Kapicki, you as well. Um, here tonight, uh, Ms. Diggins uh, has a presentation for you to outline the 24-25 Kids Plus budget. Uh, as, as you know, uh, our Kids Plus op operation is an enterprise-based service. They are completely 100% self-funded. So we rely on tuition primarily as the means to generate uh, and cover the operating expenses and certainly any other ancillary costs and expenses that come with the uh, service that we provide to families in Cabarrus County. Um, as we look ahead, obviously each year we have to forecast what might be some challenges on the horizon. And so Ms. Diggins has prepared for you tonight a bit of a review over some things that are some historical uh, content and then also looking ahead as to what might be some factors to consider moving forward such that we can continue to provide the level of service for our families and continue to serve the number of students that we have had or have been able to serve over previous years. So with that, I will turn it over to her. Thank you and good evening. Um, as Dr. Bauer said, we are 100% um, tuition funded. We generally do not receive any um, grants. We don't qualify for any local or federal funding. Um, so our tuition revenue is how we make it happen. Um, our Kids Plus budget does cover all of our expenses, including wages and salaries for all of the Kids Plus employees, um, and all of the other payroll associated costs, such as the bonuses, longevity pay, retirement, hospitalization, all of those things, that's all incorporated into our budget. Um, the budget also includes our general operating expenses, such as the instructional supplies, all of the materials and activities for the kids, um, the snacks and meals for the kids, um, any contracted services such as our school nurse services and our 4-H contract um, for the program collaboration. All of our workshop and professional development for our staff is included in that. Um, so we actually do pay for all of our employees to obtain the required annual training. We pay for them to go to the training and we pay for the training for them, which industry standards, um, most child care centers do not do that. They, they expect that their employees would do that on their own. Um, and then, of course, we do um, pay the indirect cost payments to the district um, each year. Our goal is to maintain a balanced budget, not to make a profit. So I'd like to share with you, um, just looking ahead at the 24-25 school year, we are expecting to operate at a deficit without making some adjustments. And so I'd like to share with you um, kind of the reasons why and then what our possible solutions are. So some of the contributing factors to why we would potentially operate at a deficit is um, decrease in revenue. So we've had a decrease in our workforce since COVID. Um, we've seen that a lot of our employees have moved on. We traditionally had had a lot of retirees or a lot of college students as our workforce, and that no longer is the case. So decrease in our workforce equals decrease in revenue because we cannot serve the same number of children that we were able to serve before. Um, we have been fortunate enough over the last couple of years to have qualified for the North Carolina Child Care Stabilization Grant, which has allowed us to be able to um, operate and continue with the balanced budget, but then also we were able to pay back the district for their assistance during those COVID years. Um, 
that grant does end soon. I believe April is our last um, scheduled payment for that grant. So that will end at the end of this month. Other factors include increase in expenses. So I'd like to focus first on the payroll expenses. So each year, um, wages and salaries are mandated by DPI. That's not set by our program. Um, as other child care centers, they set their own wages and salaries. We follow the, the, um, the pay scales that DPI sets forth. And over the last several of years, the minimum hourly rate has increased from 12.11 per hour to what is projected to be 16.07 per hour starting this July. So that's an over 32% increase in the last five years. The retirement and hospitalization rate increases each year, as with all industries. Um, and then similarly, uh, we talked about the contracts earlier, our nurse contracts, their hourly um, wages have increased each year as they strive to maintain the competitive wages to keep the nurses employed in the school district as opposed to going to the private sector or hospitals. Um, and then other factors that just kind of play in here, we do offer all of our CCS employees a 35% discount on their tuition. Um, and when you offer a discount, you do have to recognize that there is a, um, a loss of revenue, basically. Um, so they're not paying the full tuition price that our private pay families are paying. Um, and over the last several years, we've seen um, approximately 22% of all of our children enrolled are actually CCS employees' children. So that continues to increase each year. So with all of that, we have um, a couple proposals here. We would like to work towards a sustainable solution moving forward um, so that this isn't something that's going to have to be brought before you each and every year. Um, we would propose a minor tuition increase and we would go from $40 in the morning to $45 and from $85 in the afternoon to $90. So that's a $1 per day um, increase that aligns us more with the fair market value and we believe would not put a um, extreme burden on families. And then we would combine that with an adjustment to our indirect cost payment to the district. So currently we're at a 9% and we would propose that we would go to a 4%. And that would mean that we would only have a little over $100,000 left as a deficit and we do have fund balance um, thanks to the, the North Carolina Stabilization Grant so we would be able to use 100000 for that um, to cover that deficit lending us the balanced budget at zero for the 24-25 school year. Um, and again, like I said, the, the industry standards, the fair market value, this still puts us well below what the county rate is for Cabarrus County for child care. So we, we believe that this is a solid plan that uh, again would not put a considerable burden on families and would allow us to operate um, at a zero balanced budget and continue for, um, to be sustained for the next several years. So I, we thank you, and if you have any questions. Questions, board members? Ms. Escobar. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, the 9% to 4% of revenue, what, what, is, what does that mean? So the uh, indirect cost payment is derived from the percent of revenue. So if we, if we had, uh, projected revenue um, on here it says uh, 3.3 million dollars then 9% would be of that 3.3 so instead of being 9% it would be 4% and that's the money that you give back, back to the school to the district, district for using the buildings correct. for doing that correct okay and and then I guess Dr. Bowers if if it was reduced to that um, would that have an impact on Custodian. I'm just trying to think of like you know, yes, there's people in the buildings that are doing Fortunately. stuff. So, so we, how do how do does that cover our costs? It, it does. We ran this by our finance department before we did it. So Phil Penn was involved in this conversation. We ran these these uh, numbers by him as well, and he agreed that the four percent would cover the costs that we we need. Mm -hmm. Any other questions, board members? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Is everyone in agreement to put this on the consent agenda? Yes. Okay. We'll move to 7.05, our policies for approval on first read with Dr. Sandy Ward.
Good evening, Madam Chair, Board Members, Dr. Kopiki, Ms. Fugu. Uh, it's very good to be here this evening. We have several policies that are up for review. Um, I think you all have seen the policies that have come through in your weekly report. I did not receive any questions, so um, if you don't mind, I'll dive right in. All right, so looking at policy 5210, um, the distribution and display of non-school materials, this policy has now included information regarding um, the display of farm, farm signs on state highway right-of-ways based on new statutory provisions. So it does add that uh, provision into the policy. Any questions? Okay. Uh, policy 6220, which is the operation of school nutrition services, um, a provision based on new statutory requirements, so this is a requirement that we have to add in, has been added to prohibit the use of administrative penalties on a student for unpaid meal charges. Any questions? Okay. All right. Policy 6401, Ethics and the Purchasing Function. Uh, language was added to this policy to address the new statutory requirement that employees who are involved in the making or administering of contracts receive conflict of interest training. So that was added in. These are pretty straightforward. Oh, keep going. Okay, okay. All right. I, I like to do the look. I'm a teacher now. I, I got to do the look and see the face. Okay, my bad. Okay, 7520. It's the family and medical leave. This policy has been updated to address the new statutorily required paid parental leave. Great. Policy 7730 is employee conflict of interest. Language has um, been added to this policy to address the new statutory requirement that employees who are involved in the making and or administering of contracts receive conflict of interest training. So they are similar to 6401. Great. I think we're all trying to get home for the game. Okay, and 8101 is a fund balance, which is a new proposed policy by our CFO, um, and he talked I think a couple of weeks ago um, about fund balance and how we wanted to um, address that in Cabarrus County Schools. Any questions about this? Yeah, uh, yeah the fund balance one. Okay, Ms. Sandage, you want to go first? Okay, I'll just wait for the presentation on it because I'll probably have questions then. I just wanted to know what the exact um, changes were going to be and where well, it's, it's, a, it's a brand new policy, so it's written from scratch. So in the, in the materials here, you'll see um, we have a two sentence policy right now. That really does nothing for us because it says it's 8%, but it doesn't say 8% of what number, right? That's the first defect. In, in my mind, it also keeps money trapped on your balance sheet you can't use because between 8% and 12% of whatever number we don't know they're picking here in this policy, the money just sits there. It doesn't give you an, a mechanism for using that money. And to me, that's just dead money on a balance sheet, right? It really doesn't do anything to benefit kids. So I did a lot of work personally, because this one was personally important to me, working with other school district CFOs around the state of North Carolina, finding out what they had. And you'll see that there's a, a memo that goes, that backs up to this where it talks about some of the shortcomings that are out there, right? Um, we currently have over $7 million trapped on the balance sheet. And I, I've, I've listed out a number of large districts that have no fund balance policy at all, right? Um, including one that's a neighboring county that they're sitting on a million and a half dollars right now, and that's their entire fund balance, right? And they're similarly sized to what we are. Um, you know, there's a, a reference to the local government commission, but in, in the packet you'll see that there is a memorandum that was issued by the state treasurer's office that says, we have no idea where this came from, right? Th this 8% really applies to county governments, debt issuing agencies. It has nothing to do with school boards. Um, so the 8% really has no basis in, statute, in, in sta state statute. Um, you know, in Connecticut, 
the model was you could set aside 2% of your annual general fund operating budget a year. So my general fund operating budget in Hartford, where I was most previously, was $280 million. I could set aside 2% of that amount, was $5.6 million. And then if I wanted to use it, I had to get the authority of both my board and the local governing authority, which was the city council at that point, right? Um, so to me, um, this is a situation where your fund balance should serve as your, as your reserve account, right? It should serve as your contingency for something that you didn't budget for that suddenly became a very large unbudgeted expense. And we've had a couple of examples of that along the way of mitigating eight and a half million dollars of things that were not budgeted. And in this proposal, what I'm suggesting is it should be something significant, right? Something that's a discrete item that is $250,000 or higher that was not part of our budget that we now need to pay for. Um, and what I'm suggesting is, in this case, that we define it as 4% of a very specific number. And you can see the language. It says 4% of the county appropriation for education for the most recently computed completed fiscal year, excluding what's appropriated for Kannapolis City Schools, what's appropriated for charter schools, and anything for the capital outlay fund. Because really, we're talking about the operating part of the budget, not the capital piece of the budget. And frankly, what gets allocated out for KCS and what gets allocated out for the charters has no bearing on what we do from an operating standpoint. So a good question came up along the way, well, why 4%? Well, 4% equates to right now $3.5 million, right? That is a nice round number of what we th I think we should have as our contingency fund so that if something big came along, we'd have the ability to pay for it. Now, a large-scale event, a major hurricane, a major set of storms, where we have something that's so big, the eight, the three and a half million dollars wouldn't cover it. I'd make the case that the seven million dollars we have right now isn't going to cover it either, right? So there's a point beyond which, where you tap out of that fund, you're going in for a special appropriation to deal with whatever you need to deal with on an emergency basis until your insurance money kicks in and you have the other things kick in that would support that, right? Um, there is. Uh, we also took this to our our external auditors. And said, so can you review this? This is a draft of what we're proposing here. And, and he reacted favorably to it. It's like it makes it very clear as to what the 4% refers to, right? There's no ambiguity like we have in our current policy. So the second piece of this is what happens if you have more than 4% of that figure in your fund balance? Well, given the extent of the deferred maintenance that's sitting out there, it seemed logical to tie it to something that would make sense that would help both the district and frankly, help out the county. I mean, the only reason you have a surplus at all and have a fund balance is from a prior county appropriation that you didn't fully spend. That's the only way that you can build fund balance is a previous year when they gave you money, you didn't spend all of it, and you parked the rest of it in the bank, right, in the most simple of terms. So why not come up with something that's got a very clear process as to, okay, if we go over this, we're going to pick the next item on the list to say we're going to go address that now. Now, it may be that you may not be able to go over that amount, right? Let's say, let's say it's a, you're $150,000 over it, and the next project's $350,000. Well, it still takes some of the long-term burden off the county and off the county tax buyers by saying, we're not just going to sit on this money, we're going to put it to use going forward. So at, at the end of the day, what we're proposing here is something that gives clarity to what the amount is that you're measuring. It creates a process for how you use it because both the superintendent and the CFO have to agree to it, bring it to the board, and be able to appropriate it. And it gives long-term visibility to say, okay, if we continue to exceed that amount, how do we deal with it? How does it become accessible to us and to the county going forward, right? So it's not a situation where you're building up to a 20 or $25 million fund balance as we've seen in past years that you then needed to create a plan for how to use it. This specifies how it gets used going forward. So all that said, um, there was a lot of different pieces that came in in terms of feedback on this, solicited advice from other CFOs, um, and just past experience, frankly, if I'm being candid about it, uh, that I hope this creates a policy that it creates greater clarity for us going forward to understand how the fund balance really should be working for us. So this is in conjunction with getting rid of some of the things that we were using fund balance for that we really shouldn't have been using fund balance for. Well, I, I think it more gives you clarity around 
how you would use it going forward. That there's a very clear expectation that things would come off your list as you go forward. You know, at one point, I told you, I think the last time when we presented on the 25th, we published the entire list of all the projects that we had. Well, those are prioritized. So that they, to the extent that we create a surplus that we can then knock a project off that list, that's where we know it's going to go. Ms. Escobar? So thank you for that explanation because that helps me. Uh, because originally when I just was comparing language, it, it, that wasn't enough. So to clarify, so now we have to hold on to 4%, right? Yep. We're not going down to zero. It's not the intent is to not go down to zero. Okay, I can't so tell you we won't ever go down to zero because something could happen that drives it to zero. Right, right? rainy day fund. Yeah. Right. right, okay, unexpected. Right. But if it's not unexpected and we have a surplus, you're saying it has to go to deferred maintenance. Correct. Okay, if, so if it we're, can't. If we're over that threshold. Now, they, now remember, to the extent your county appropriation increases, the 4% of whatever that number is, is also going to, so in a way it's indexed to whatever the county is giving you each year, right? Right. So if I say three and a half million this year, it's not three and a half million next year, right? So, and, and then getting back to the unexpected, expected expenses so I mean we we just saw your other presentation and we had 8.5 million you know yep. is it is it natural events or is it the surprise events too like what yes right I, I think I think we can't predict with any certainty what the event might look like right but clearly it would be happy to be something that Dr. Kapicki or and I or whoever our successors are would say this is going to be a problem for us we don't have funding to cover this and it becomes a question of, okay, well, can we mitigate it, right? You know, if I, w I had not been able to, with my team and everybody else to mitigate that eight and a half million, we might be having a conversation around some of the things that were adverse development over $250,000 that was not in our original budget. We need to take a fund balance appropriation to make up the difference this year. Okay. But even with this policy, everything still has to come through us. We're still... Correct. Okay. Correct. The, the CFO and the superintendent cannot operate independently under this policy. Thank you. Ms. Sandage. All right. So if and when this goes down to 4%, what happens to the other 4%? Does it go to some of these things that we need to knock off the list? Because right now we're sitting at 8% in our fund balance, correct? Because of this previous language. Mm -hmm. So when we... If, if and when we approve this 4%, what happens to the other 4%? Is that what you're saying it's going to go to something? I think it's going to go to something else. Now, keep in mind that 8% is of the total number that, frankly, is not the way you would measure this right now. Right? What am I looking at wrong? Because right now we're sitting at 8%. You're at 8% of a total local appropriation that includes a bunch of stuff that I don't think you should be including in that number. Right. So I think you're going to dislodge some money out of this process that then can become available to you if the board so decides that we can start addressing some of the other things that are on that deferred maintenance list. Because yeah. in other words, we're taking 8% of $90 million, and I'm saying the $90 million is not the right number to be looking at. Oh, yeah. Miss Lindsay? Can you give us an amount of money <coughs> that we're going to have to oh. be able to, I mean, like, just, you know. I'm just trying to figure out like what, how much money we're talking that we're going to have. I would love to get closer to the end of the year to answer that question, okay. right? Just knowing how much volatility we've already seen in this year. Right. If I was to guess, I don't like guessing, but I will, right? Now, keep in mind, I put something else in here that it doesn't count inventory because I, I can't pay Attorney Eisenhower's bills with light bulbs, right? So there, there, I have to set aside something for inventory, right? So if I was to say, okay, we're sitting on, let's say, $7.2 million right now. That's where we ended 2023. That was our fund balance. If I'm saying the right number is 3.5 plus 1.1 for inventory, that implies 4.6. The difference between the 4.6 and the 7.2 is $2.6 million. That's what I think this, this frees up for us. Sure. Let me take you through it, right? <laughs> so we were, we were, all right, and, and all right. again, I'm, so talking, wanna, I'm talking rough yeah. numbers here, right? I'm talking yeah. rough numbers. One thing we could yeah. do is just, um, 
You would always a couple different ways. It's it's and also it's hard to grasp it sometimes in an abstract way. I'm very visual. So when I see the visual presentation, I grab it. So when Phil and I sat down and went through this, we marked it up on a board and yeah. went through all the numbers. It might be helpful to the board if we could do that maybe down the road. But I, what you're saying is the visual representation. So if you just kind so, of so I, I would love to have a telestrator in here at some point because I think that would be beneficial, right? So let's let's say the, the the budget that we're working off was ninety million dollars. That's the totality of what we received, including all the money for KCS, including all the money for for charters. That again, I'm arguing shouldn't be part of this equation, right? Because it doesn't pertain to us. So eight percent of ninety million dollars is seven point two million. You've heard me say that number before, and you heard us talk about it when we had the audit, right? Well, within that, you have a million one of inventory, right? And that stay, that tends to stay pretty stable. Again. I'm suggesting you don't count that toward the three and a half million. Three and a half million plus the 1.1 million for inventory is 4.6. The difference between the 4.6 and the 7.2 is $2.6 million. If this policy was to move forward, it would create the opportunity to unlock $2.6 million off your balance sheet to then start to address some of the deferred maintenance items that you have on that list. Okay. I got it, I got okay. it now. Okay. Mr. Tradaway. I just want to um, applaud that we have a CFO who does not like to guess. <laughs> <laughs> I'll unmute. I'll mute myself now. <laughs> uh -oh. Anything else, board members? Okay. Is the board in agreement to put these on the agenda for the consent agenda for our business session? Okay. Right, terrific. Thank you much. Thank you. We're going to go to 7.06 in our budget resolution and amendment number four, summary of change. Mr. Penn. All right, I think, I think this is the last time you see me tonight. Um, so I, as I mentioned earlier tonight, we're continuing to make good progress toward shrinking the deficit for 23-24 in our local budget. Uh, I mentioned earlier how we've bumped up the interest income uh, expectation for this year to a total of 500,000 versus initial budget of 250,000. Forecast for fines and forfeiture funds from the from the county that they remit over to us is up another 550,000 to uh, just under 1.9 million. Uh, when you look at the initial budget resolution that's in your packet, you'll see now that we're showing for fund two, our local current expense fund, a deficit of 263,325. That's a reduction of 800,000 for where it was before, and it's directly related to that anticipated increased revenue. So I'm hopeful, and I'll just bring this right back to Mr. Treadway's statement about don't guess. Uh, I'm hopeful that in May we bring this back, this initial resolution one more time with a balanced budget, right? And that sort of sets us up for the, for the, what we need to have for the full year. So we had worked very closely with our auditors to understand that you can change your initial budget resolution as many times as you want to prior to June 30th. But by June 30th, you have to have a, a balanced budget amendment as if you had started the year with a balanced budget, right? So we will achieve that. And my hope is to do it at the next meeting in May. Um, within that, you also have budget amendment numbers, uh, num number four. You can see a touch to funds one, two, three, eight, four, and five. Now, that's, that's an odd way of going through the numbering, but it really is one, two, three, eight is, is our operating budget. Four is capital, five is child nutrition, right? So we tend to group one, two, three, and five to, and four together, or so one, two, three, and eight together, and everything else is sort of like outside of the scope of like the, the normal operating budget. So what changed? Um, overall in fund one, that's our state public school fund, decrease of about $450,000. That was a reduction of six and a half position allotments due to use of the NC virtual school and a final adjustment for charter school enrollment. We, we knew about that. That's been in our budget forecast for a while, right? Our deficit forecast. So that's not a, a new hit to the, to, the, to, the, to the deficit. We also picked up about $110,000 for an education and workforce innovation program. So that was a positive. But overall, decrease of 458000 as I mentioned. 
Local Fund 2 has literally got a $500 move between two budget lines. Uh, you know, we, we have to disclose that to you and make it part of our amendment, so be it. Uh, within federal, uh, the overall increase was about $83,000, uh, a slight increase in our overall Title III funding that came through, and an award of almost $74,000 for the Educational and Competitive After School Robotics Grant. So that's a, nice, that's a nice win for us on the federal side. Uh, special Revenue Fund 8, total increase of $10,000 plus to adjust the Bible study programs for high schools. That is not public funds that is donated to us. So we're not using public funds to support the Bible program. But again, since it's part of the budget that's presented to you, we're including that as part of the amendments. Capital outlay, uh, this is a reclassification of funding between projects. Um, this actually happens a fair amount, right? As we get closer to the end of projects, we either see that we have a deficit or we have a surplus within that project. We will work with the county to move some of the amounts of dollars around. Uh, in this particular case, there's no, no net change in the overall budget, right? So we're taking dollars from three projects and putting it toward a, dollar that, uh, a project that's short. Uh, but it, it doesn't impact the overall change in, in, in that, um, in fund four. Um, so, as a, you know, if anybody is interested in the details, we have a dehumidification project at Mount Pleasant Middle School that we've got savings of about $60,000. We had a gym floor replacement at Wolf Meadow that came in $60,000 to, to better than we anticipated. Uh, an elevator replacement at Concord High School for $27,000 that came in better than we expected. So we were using those funds to... Uh, work on it's, it's water damage at WM Irvin Elementary to the tune of 147,000. So again, we're moving money off three projects to a fourth project, no net change overall, but we're disclosing it to you because we're required to, right? So we want to make sure you have that transparency. But I will tell you, as a, as a matter of practice, that type of movement happens a lot uh, as we start to close these projects out. Um, and lastly, uh, Child Nutrition uh, Fund 5, uh, net increase of $800,000. That just reflects the revised forecast on their part for revenue and expenses for the full year based on our actual results through the month of March. And that's, of course, one of the two operations that we have that we refer to as our business operations, right? School Nutrition Program and, and our, our Kids Plus Program effectively run like businesses. They're not treated the same way as you have the government side of the enterprise, which is really the traditional operation of a school district. So um, again, no impact on taxpayer funds within Fund 5. That's, that's sort of a standalone program. Okay. So incorporating all that together, um, the budgeted expenditures for 23-24 now stand at just a hair under $510 million. And you'll see all those in the budget resolutions that are in your packet. So there's an amended budget resolution to amend the first one that we have of the year. Um, that's what you see there first. And then uh, revision number four will capture all the different detail that I just went through in the memorandum as well. Okay. Any questions, board members? Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Everyone in agreement to put this on the consent agenda? Okay. So we'll move to 7.07. .07. This is the 2425 board calendar. Board members, are there any discussion about the board calendar? I did want to just make sure that there was clarification about um, November. It is um, in November there will be a board meeting on the 12th, which is a Tuesday, instead of a Monday on the 11th. Any questions about that? Uh, January. Six or the four? Oh, okay. So we also have a meeting on Tuesday for Martin Luther King instead of that Monday on the 13th. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's what okay. Just thank you. Yeah. Anything else? I, and I don't know the specific dates, but I just want to make sure that our board meeting doesn't coincide with open house this year. I don't know the specific date, but I did mention that, you know, for several board meetings. And it I doesn't. I, I, I put it in my calendar for that reason. I think open house night, I don't know for elementary schools, but for middle and high schools is the 7th. 7th and 8th. 7th and 8th. Okay. So we're yeah. good to go. Elementary is August the 8th. For open house. So we should be good on that. Thanks. 
Okay. Any other questions? Everyone in agreement to put this on the consent agenda? Yes. Okay, great. We're going to move to 7.08, our construction manner at risk recommendations for the Mary France, Francis Wall Pre-K replacement with Mr. Brian Cohn. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the board, Dr. Kapicki. So the Department of Construction did receive statements of qualification from four different construction manager at risk firms interested in being a part of the Mary Francis Wall Pre-K replacement project. A review committee that was comprised of department staff and district leadership Read these statements, and those members were Mr. Chuck Taylor, Mr. Craig Nichols, Mr. Harold Hahn, Mrs. Dorothy Bramhall, Mr. Tim Louder, and myself. The evaluation matrix rated each firm on six different criteria, which were the experience in providing pre construction and construction management services for similar projects, the approach to the project, the ability to meet the established schedule, qualifications, and ability of key individuals proposed for this project the client subcontractor and design references, and a location of office in North Carolina relative to the project site. Based on the submissions received by the committee and the scores of each firm, it is our recommendation that Lyles Construction Company Incorporated be selected as the construction manager at risk for the new Mary Frances Wall Pre-K replacement project. Once approved, staff will begin negotiating the terms of the A133 contract and bring that back before this board at the June 24 meeting for approval. Lyle's Construction Company then will begin their pre-construction pricing with the current drawings and program in hand and begin to identify a total construction budget. And I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. Will the board be able to see that matrix? Uh, I can share that with you, yes. Okay. If you would like. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Any, any questions, Mr. Floyd? The companies that aren't chosen are they give, what kind of feedback are they given for their their own benefit to help uh, them to, to we, we, next time? We generally, most, I'm not going to say all of them, but a, a large number of the firms for any of these projects, whether architectural or construction, reach out for a debrief, which we sit down with them and just kind of talk through the scoring. And, you know, sometimes it's just not the right fit. You know, sometimes there's obvious reasons within their submission as to why they weren't selected. Um, sometimes it's splitting hairs, you know, I mean, incorrect information presented to us, you know, because all these firms that we interview are great firms. Yeah, I just want to make sure the public understands that mm -hmm. we're, we're working with everybody here, not just picking favorites and not getting back to, to everybody yep. else. Ms. Escobar. And following up on that, uh, what is our history with Lyle's Construction? What have they done for us before? Uh, Lyle's Construction uh, was the contractor of record on a design build contract for the Performance Learning Center that was built back in 2018. That was the last project they were a part of. And they are a local firm in Concord, North Carolina. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you. Is everyone in agreement to put this on the consent agenda for the business session? I'd like it on action, please. Okay, we'll put it on action. Okay, we're going to move to our item that is for action, 8.01, a policy uh, for approval and adoption on first read. And we'll have Mr. Legrand. Good evening. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the board, Dr. Kapicki. Revisions for policy 4342 were part of our regular fall 2023 PLS updates from the North Carolina School Board Association. Changes were made within the first paragraph and section A based on new state, state law, which is General Statute 115C-391.2, stipulating that both the school official and the adult witness must be of the same gender as a student during physical searches of individual students at school. Also to maintain safety and security within our schools as it relates to policy 4342, our CCS policy committee vetted and has proposed additional revisions to section B of the policy. Section B addresses suspicionless searches, which are also known as random safety checks and that was reviewed by the committee due to current policy wording that potentially restricts the search of students' personal belongings, such as book bags, et cetera, during random safety screenings during the school day. <clears throat> Both of these proposed revisions aim to better assist school teams 
with implementing sensible protocols that are consistent with current state statutes governing student searches. I would also like to point out that the last time this policy was revised was in 2013. Due to the need to update our current policy to be compliant with state law and the time sensitive nature of this revision as it pertains to student safety, we ask that the board suspend the rules and adopt this policy tonight as an exception to our normal first read, second read practice. Any questions about this, Ms. Sandage? Any thoughts from the board members who are on the policy committee? Uh, Mr. Walter and I are on the policy committee. I, I commend the committee and Mr. Middlebrooks for the, uh, th there was a lot of conversation around this policy. Uh, I, I, uh, it is in part of that conversation, I'd like to echo the need for timing that we are, um, there's, a, there's a need for us to resolve a lot of issues on this policy uh, immediately and so I, I I'm, I'm willing to actually make a motion that we suspend the rules to do that thank you so I have a motion to suspend the rules I'll second that. I have a second a motion by mr. Treadaway a second by miss Lindsay all those in favor of suspending the rules for policy 2040 and voting on this on first read say aye, aye. opposed okay Ms. Lindsay. So I, I just wanted mm -hmm. to, okay, so if we can speak openly mm -hmm. about this, mm -hmm. um, tell me some of the things that, like, is this going to significantly start to reduce some of our issues in the school systems with vaping and um, potential, you know, things brought into the school? Just tell me how this is going to make it better. So, for example, the way that the policy is written now, if we have a random safety check, it specifies and limits that we can only search a student's locker and search a, their desk. Well, we know that we don't typically use lockers in a lot of our schools now, and students don't put items that they're supposed to have at school in their desk. It is normally in their book bag. It is normally on their person which is why we have these random safety checks. Um, the way that the policy is written back in 2013 when their lockers were used a lot, um, and I guess they must have put a lot of stuff in their desk back then, um, you know, that th this was met their needs. But now when we need to be able to search book bags for items such as vapes, weapons, um, other items that are making our schools unsafe, we need to have the, the policy worded where that is part of our normal process during these random safety checks. So when we do these safety checks, sorry, sorry. When we do these safety checks and, and a kid is now gonna be potentially searched, the SRO will be there, right? If it is, if, if something is, gives a, an administrator reasonable suspicion, at that point, they are able to be searched individually. And then if the SRO is able to uh, deem it probable cause, then the SRO then becomes involved in the search. And what about parents? Will they be contacted first prior to, or how, how is that gonna work? Because I, I know that, you know, as a parent, obviously, if you're gonna search my child, I'm gonna kind of, I'm gonna wanna know what's happening. There, there is communication with the parent. The, what section B specifically is addressing though are the random safety searches. For example, we're gonna search a total class or we're going to search kids as they come in the building off of a bus. Um, and those are without probable cause or reasonable suspicion. Those are just random safety random checks. Safety. Whereas is written into section B now that that includes lockers and desks that doesn't allow us to, by policy, without reasonable suspicion, search any other belongings on the students, which is where most of these items are contained. So this, this is just allowing, allowing school administrators uh, a lot more 
a, a, a lot greater ability to remove these items from campuses that shouldn't be there because they're able to search those those uh, personal student bags and uh, and belongings. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions, Ms. Sandage? Humor me. This didn't just become an issue. So why is it so important right now? I mean, it's important, but like what's happened? What did I miss? Well, when we got the PLS update uh, to look at part A, which was part of that general stu uh, statute that we looked at, we then as a policy committee looked at the rest of the policy and said, wait a second, this doesn't make sense. I knew something was up. Thank you. Anything else? Mr. Treadaway? I just want to point out, too, that the revisions that the policy committee is recommending, I and feel free to disagree. I think it's much clearer for our staff now that um, this is what we can do, this is what we don't do. So I think it's made our staff the clarity. It's, it's provided any nebulous gray areas. It's made, it, it, I think it serves our administration and staff a lot better as well. Ms. Lindsay. So is there another, are there other, to, to, Keith, to Keisha's point, what other policies are out there that are inhibiting us from keeping our schools as safe as we possibly can? I am not aware of any specific policy uh, that is urgent as this one uh, to, okay. to keep, help keep our school as safe as, okay. as, as we can. Because to her point, we've had an issue with vaping and, and things like that for a really long time. Mm -hmm. So the, the fact that we're talking about this now in April when school is almost over, I, I feel like we could have, I just feel like we should have been looking at these policies earlier to see what we could do as a school system to help mitigate some of these problems that we've had all school year long. Yeah, and again, this discussion was brought about as part of the PLS update and then as we started to unravel what this policy said as uh, as uh, was just mentioned Mr. Treadway just m mentioned is that we wanted to make this as clear as possible so it would we would assist our administrators with keeping these items out of our schools anything else okay board members yeah, I, was gonna, Matt, I was just gonna say I'll make it uh, I would like to submit a motion that we approve this uh, as presented. I have a motion by Mr. Treadaway. I need a second. Second. I have a second by Mr. Floyd. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, this policy has been approved. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, I'm sorry. Sandage. I just have a question in general for, you know, situations like this. How do we as a district not wait on a PLS to catch something of this magnitude? That's my initial concern and the reason for my earlier question. The, I, there's a lot of policies uh, that have not been updated in a, in, in a large period of time like this one, the one on 2013. Um, I can't answer about individual policies, but I do think we need to do uh, as best job as we can in making sure that these things are reviewed and updated. Frankly, I think historically what, you, what you're relying mostly on, and it works very well in your district, is the policy committee, and then they review the policies as they come through, and the PLS kind of, PLS kind of keeps us up to speed as to the legal changes and, and how we should be addressing those. Occasionally, like this one, um, you're going to catch something that maybe is a little outdated that we need to act on a little quicker. Um, this is actually a good catch by Mr. Legrand and the policy committee that did a really nice job at going through this, not just the recommendations, but the other things that were misaligned so that we would be um, able to enact this quicker and, and put it in, into place immediately. To your question, Ms. Sanders, I think it's, behoove, it, it's be incumbent on us to this is an example of maybe we need to take a harder look at our policies closer and see which ones are really outdated and haven't been updated in five, six, seven years and maybe get get the, get them on the policy committee's agenda sooner rather than later so we don't run into this situation again. Thank you. And I do appreciate the work of the policy committee catching this and, and you getting it in front of us so that we can approve it and do something about it. I just wanted to make sure that we're looking at you know, like the bigger picture here. There could potentially be other policies that 
need we need to take a hard look at and what's the process for that so thanks for clarifying yes and i i agree with that and, and i want to thank the board for acting quickly on this as well thank you okay board members we'll move to 9.01 I'll call for a motion that the board convene in closed session to consult with an attorney and preserve the attorney-client privilege pursuant to General Statute 143-318-11A3, including the case involving Save Our Schools Association. And Madam Chair, I just I want to make one um, addition to that. I think we also go under A6 for personnel matters as well. I think um, that um, th there'll be a personnel matter to discuss as well. Okay. I'll make the motion to approve that. Second. Okay, I have a motion by Ms. Lindsay, a second by Mr. Floyd. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? We are now in closed session.